podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. Uh, before I introduce the show, let me just remind you, it's the beginning of the year, which means it's time for our annual listener survey. I'd love to know more about you. It helps us pick the right programming, tailor our programming to your interests. And also, frankly, it helps us with advertisers because we don't tell them anything about you. So it's helpful if we can say, you know, how many men, how many women, that kind of thing. Uh, if you go to twit.tv slash survey 21, you could take it. It won't take more than a few minutes. It's completely anonymous and it really helps us. Twit.tv slash survey 21, our 2021 annual survey. Thank you in advance. I really appreciate it. Now, this show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, January 10th, 2021. It's episode 1761. Enjoy. The Tech Guy Podcast is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Now you can look forward to a successful new year with a brand new career in IT thanks to the best IT education around. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Just use the code TWIT30 at checkout. And by ExpressVPN. Stop letting people keep logs of what you do online. Protect your online privacy with one click. For three extra months free with their one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash techguy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the uh, tech guy. Yeah, that's me. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, you know, all that stuff in the toy store. Phone number 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside the country, uh, you could still call us. Just use Skype. It shouldn't cost you anything. 888-827-5536. Things we talk about on the show will be jotted down, notated by our scribe, James DeRuvo, at the website, techguylabs.com. And uh, that's free, open, available to all, thanks to our fine sponsors. And uh, there's no sign-up or anything. Techguylabs.com. A couple of big anniversaries this weekend. This is the 13th anniversary of the unveiling of the iPhone. Steve Jobs, remember it? I guess it was Macworld Expo in San Francisco taking the stage. There had been lots of rumors that Apple was working on a phone, but none confirmed because Apple, you know, tight-lipped. Steve Jobs took the stage and started talking about three new devices, an Internet communicator, an iPod <laughs> and a phone, an internet communicator, an iPod and a phone. And he said it several times. And he said, you get in the message? It's not three devices. It's one. It's the, and we were waiting, drum roll, please, iPhone. And the crowd went crazy. I, I confess, you know, when you're a journalist at an event like that, you're supposed to sit on your hands. You know, you're not supposed to show partisanship or anything, but it was pretty hard not to leap to your feet and cheer when Apple announced the iPhone, because yeah, maybe you don't remember this, but smartphones really, it was kind of a struggling category. We had Microsoft's, you know, uh, Windows Mobile stuff, which was just awful. BlackBerry, which was pretty good, but still, you know, a struggle. And those are the ones with the physical keyboards and they had a little trackball. <laughs> that was my last phone before the iPhone came out. A little BlackBerry, they called it the Pearl, BlackBerry Pearl. And a little screen, tiny little screen. At least you had a keyboard for text messaging. But it really, it wasn't a smartphone in the way we've come to understand it. Apple changed the world on that day back in 2007. So happy, happy birthday to the iPhone. And you know, Apple, it's interesting because uh, this week there have been a ton of rumors that Apple is working with Hyundai the Korean car manufacturer, to make an Apple car. And uh, it would be a couple of years off. But, uh, you know, that's the problem when you have a great success like the iPhone. It's, it's, well, now what? What have you done for me lately? And that's, you know, stockholders saying that. Although, no, I don't think anybody's unhappy with, with, with the growth of the Apple stock. 
Not at all. And I should mention that uh, I've been left out of that because I'm not, you know, I don't own any tech stocks. <laughs> at least I own mutual funds that possibly have some tech stocks in there, but I don't own any individual stocks at all. Also an anniversary, this one I think equally important, although perhaps not as celebrated, it's the 20th anniversary of Wikipedia. The one thing, the one thing you could say without hesitation that... <laughs> That the internet has brought us that's truly good. <laughs> no advertising. They've fought it forever. They do beg for money frequently because no advertising. Uh, and I donate 10 bucks a month, have for years, because I use it. The thing is incredibly valuable. Incredibly valuable. And amazingly, considered that it's crowdsourced, it's an encyclopedia that has replaced, really put out of business, the World Book and the Britannica and all the other encyclopedias by being up to date, by being accurate, even though it's it's created by users, it's community edited. Uh, it's it's kind of an it's an amazing thing that uh, I mean it's a perfect example of all the beauty that the internet is capable of, all the usefulness the internet is capable of. So we should celebrate twenty years for Wikipedia. I don't think I'll be celebrating the uh, the birth of <laughs> Twitter. It's about 14 years old. Or the birth of Facebook. It's uh, How old is Facebook? About the same, right? If you start way back when from with Harvard, um, it might be, uh, might be 17 years old, something like that, when Mark Zuckerberg first wrote it. In both cases, this, these, have, these have proven problematic in so many ways. And we're seeing this now because... Facebook, Twitter, Shopify, Pinterest, TikTok have all banned the president of the United States. Uh, and depending on what side of the aisle you're on, you might say, well, it's about time. Why do they wait so long? And on the other side, you might say, well, see, this is an example of the power that these platforms wield. That they can silence the president, the duly elected president of the country. It's a, it had to have been a very tough choice uh, for those platforms. I think made easier by the pretty clear insight to violence, insurrection, and a coup d'etat tweeted by the president, Facebooked by the president, apparently Pinterested by the president. I don't. That's amazing. Uh, the president and his supporters have moved to uh, non-censored sites like Gab and Parler. But uh, big tech is not uh, taking that lying down. Parler's been removed from both Apple and Google's stores. The threat of that, though, made that made it the number one app <laughs> on the on the Apple Store for some time. Uh, Parler and Gab both with huge hundreds of thousands of new users in the past few days. Because where else are you going to go, right? But it may not last long because. It, Parler runs on Amazon's web services, AWS, as many sites do, our sites do. And AWS has told Parler, you have till midnight tonight to, uh, what, to moderate your content. There's a lot of violent content advocating the assassination of the vice president of the United States, members of Congress, I mean, inciting violent action uh, in D.C. on the inauguration day. There's a lot of nasty stuff there. So I think not unreasonable. Parler will have to find another service, but I wonder, you know, I wonder where they're going to go. It, it, you know, I'm, I have very mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, it's pretty clear this had to be done. The time had come. Uh, you can't, you know, when you use these platforms to incite mob violence regardless of who you are you've you know they've got to do something about that and i think that's what they decided but it does underscore the immense power these platforms have because here well you know here's a president of the united states going where do i post my videos now maybe he's not he can't do it on youtube either now, now maybe you know previous presidents haven't had the benefit of facebook twitter youtube spotify or pinterest and have somehow managed to get Get their voice heard. It is, after all, what they call the bully pulpit. Who was that Teddy Teddy Roosevelt who called it the bully pulpit? Uh, 
you know, I, you're the president. You, you probably don't need social media. Yet, I think a lot of people uh, on the left as well as the right are going, hmm. Hmm. The other problem, of course, is it's very, very selective because they haven't taken down other world leaders like the head of the Taliban or Iran's president or President Modi of India, who's advocated violence against uh, the free press or President Duterte in the, the Philippines. There are, there are other despots using those platforms for malicious and malign and uh, evil purposes and you know they're they're not taking them down so it's a it's a challenge it's a challenge and uh and we are we are in let's 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 be clear uncharted waters there's no doubt about that uh it's a, a kind of a reckoning for a big tech isn't it and the investigations go on for facebook for google uh those those uh Department of Justice actions will not go away when there's a new president in a week and a half. That That's not going to change. I think we're all grappling with the power big tech has and, and what we what we want to do about it. I, I don't like Facebook one bit. I'm not on it. Nor will I use WhatsApp or Instagram, either of their other uh, applications. I certainly don't put them on my phone. And that's, you know, thanks to Apple, by the way, we now know how much information they gather. Because Apple has these new privacy labels they started enforcing just a month ago. And uh, all, these, <laughs> all these companies, including Google, are having to say, well, yeah, we collect this, 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 and this. We know where you are, what you're doing. Is that okay? Are you all right with that? I think a lot of people are starting to think, maybe not. Maybe not. Your smartphone, as I've said many times, is the ultimate tracking device. It's got GPS built in, always on connection to the internet, a camera, and a microphone. I mean, <laughs> if this were a spy movie, this is the kind of device the spy would plant in your car to keep track of who you are. You're just carrying it around going, yeah, I like my smartphone. We can blame Apple for that too, 13 years ago today. Uh, 80, look, there's lots to talk about. And you know, I know what most of us just would like to bury our heads in the sand. Let's just talk about why my printer isn't working or... How come Windows isn't <laughs> isn't up to date? Things like that, and that's fine too. Eighty eight, eighty eight. Ask Leo, our car guy, coming up. Samable Samad. I'm going to ask him where my Mustang is. That's for sure. Sam, where's my Mustang? Uh, we also have our space guy Rod Pyle coming up in just a little bit. We can talk about the mission to Mars, or or you know, there's lots to talk about with that. Um. And, of course, our photography guru, Chris Marquardt. It's going to be a fun, fun day. A light day, I promise. We'll, we'll take it easy today. She is, ladies and gentlemen, the unbreakable phone angel. Many have tried. All have failed. <laughs> Kim Schaffer. Hello, Kimmy. Hello. Kimmy, don't take no Schaffer. That is, by the way, again, credit to the uh, folks at the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, because we just kind of lifted their theme song for you. But you're also unbreakable, so that's yeah. good. Jane Krakowski was just on uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me on My Way Here. So um, I think I'm going to have to go back and revisit the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt because I never got through the whole series. Yeah, she's the boss, right? Uh, she she uh, She's somebody big. Somebody, I forget. Yeah. It's been so many years yeah. since I watched that first it's good, season. It's a good show, and I think they're coming back, aren't they? I think so, yeah. yeah. The yeah. problem with all these shows is, you know, they go away for two or three years and come back, and I just forget what happened i still haven't finished ozark <laughs> yeah i do the same thing i drift off and everybody says oh you got to watch this I know, so i watch the first it. Watch. yeah i might just a lot, a lot of times i just go to bed instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so be a good idea <laughs> uh, but i'm out of bed now so i guess i should do a show who should, who should well, i let's talk, talk to? to mario who's uh, afraid he won't be able to watch some of his material oh. soon like oh three <laughs> uh oh Thank you, Kim. Hello, Mario from San Fernando. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey. I'm, it's a pleasure talking to you. Big, been a big fan for many years. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for calling and for those kind words. Yeah, so my question was, yeah, my question is, I, I have a large, uh, you know, Blu-ray 3D collection, and I have an old uh, Panasonic plasma that's been great nice. for like maybe the last 10 those years. Those Vieras, they were so upgrade. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, 
And before that, I had a Pioneer Kuro, which I love. Also, excellent plasma. And, um, I own both of them. I love. In yeah. fact, we still have our Viera. It's a great, great TV. Uh, yeah, so I was looking to upgrade those, something a little larger and a little more modern. And I was looking around for what's. 3D capable, and I really didn't see 3D? it. So 3D? 3D? Really? Yeah. You like to wear those glasses? and <laughs> Yeah, nobody makes a 3D TV anymore. That died. About two years ago, they stopped making those. Uh, all right. Because I think, honestly, I'm honestly, uh, Mario, I think you're the only one. <laughs> oh, oh, nope. John, our studio manager, says he wants it too. But uh, yeah, you keep that Viera. You know, it's funny. I, I, I have the glasses that came with the Viera, and they're all dusty because I never used them. So so you have a lot of... We love it. Really? And you have a lot of uh, 3D yeah. Blu-rays, huh? I do. Mm. Um, boy, you know, you'll still be able to watch them in 2D. But 3D is ba uh, the the TV industry decided, it and uh, as a whole, eh, yeah, this isn't going anywhere, and they just killed it. I'm sorry. No projectors either. No, nothing, zero. Uh, yeah, you're. Right. Yeah, I'm really sorry. But again, you'll still be able to watch it 2D. But uh, keep the Viera, in other words, keep it working. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. thank you for the info. The Viera was good because it had, I, I, as I remember, it had active uh, 3D glasses. So there, was, there are a couple of ways. And you still, by the way, there's still 3D movie theaters. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do 3D. One is passive. And it's very similar to the old, remember the <laughs> red and green glasses, the paper glasses, you know? Uh, it's very similar to that, except that they're not red and green. They're just polarized differently so one's got horizontal bars you can't see them but they're horizontal polarization and one's got vertical polarization and the trick is for 3d to work the screen has to display two images and uh one for each eye right so somehow the screen has to do that that's why you can need tv support and then somehow you need some glasses that will somehow separate those two images in fact, if you turn on 3D on your TV without the glasses, you'll see the two images, and it's, you know, like a ghost. It's it's disturbing. It's not something you'd want to watch. With the glasses, you could separate it. So the passive technique used uh, polarization. The negative, the drawback on that uh, is that it also cut how bright the picture was by half, 50-50. And I'm trying to remember, but I think the Vieras used active, which meant they had shutters in them that would flicker in, in alternate... <laughs> an alternate uh, back and forth and um that also cut the you know the visibility in half no actually now i think of it i think they had real d glasses come to think of it they were passive it's kind of expensive there, there were only a few places that you would is that right no because you charged them no 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 you charged them that's the thing you had to have power and they had batteries so if you really like 3D, here's what you have to do. You have to uh, go to visors, those uh, VR visors. You can actually watch Netflix and other things. I don't know how you'd get your Blu-ray in there, but there might be a way. In the 3D visors in 3D. In fact, they, many of them, the Oculus Quest, the Rift, the Vive, have theater experiences where you're in a theater. You look to your left and right. There's nice red plush seats. There's a stage in front of you. That's where the movie's playing. <laughs> And, of course, if you like 3D, there's a, a ton of really interesting, compelling 3D experiences, mostly games, but others as well. I think that's what you should look at. My, my favorite, it requires a Facebook account, so I don't use it, is the Oculus Quest 2 that just came out. Inexpensive, doesn't require a standalone PC. It's standalone, doesn't require a PC. It's a good choice. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Sam is coming up with Car Talk. Our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. I'm sorry, I, I'm laughing at something that Professor Laura said. I am a big fan, as you know, I am a big fan of IT Pro TV. They kind of started, I kind of feel a little responsible for them, to be honest with you. Uh, when they, they started because they, Don and Tim, Don Pazette and Tim Broom were IT trainers, but classroom style. And they uh, came to an event that uh, I was part of, a panel. Uh, about the future of internet broadcasting uh, at the uh, NAB show some many years ago. And they got inspired. They said, you know, we could do IT training that way. 
and IT Pro TV was born. And by the way, they have far exceeded anything I've done. They have five live studios producing fabulous content, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. That's how you get to 5,800 on-demand hours of IT training in every area of IT. Now, I want to talk to people who are interested in getting into IT as a career or have IT jobs and want to get better at it. That's who IT Pro TV is for. And this is January. This month is Getting Started in IT Month at IT Pro TV. A great time to start a new career in the IT industry, which is, by the way, despite COVID, growing like crazy, maybe because of it, right? Technology is even more important now. This month, they're doing some special stuff that you can do for free. Two webinars for budding IT Pro uh, folks, people wanting to get in the business. A free weekend training with five courses available at no charge. And a ton of videos on their YouTube channel about starting a new career in IT. This is all for you. They have plans for business that helps keep your IT team on top of their game. Very important nowadays because IT is a moving target. There's always something new to learn. Versions get updated. Hardware and software, brand new. you got to keep up with it. There's personal plans that will help you accelerate your IT career or get into IT. It's a really a one-stop shop for IT training. Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, Linux. No matter what you're interested in, you'll be able to earn IT certifications and improve your IT skills. They're also the only official video training partner for CompTIA, which means you can get those really valuable certs, often the first certs people get in, uh, you know, the uh, CompTIA A+, plus or Network+, plus or Security+, plus certs. They're very good. They're really often kind of required to get that first job in IT. And you don't have to worry about staying on track because they also offer learning coaches who will help you choose the path for IT that works for you. And there are a lot of different paths in the IT business, as you probably know. Um, they have great job resources to help you get that first job. And, of course, the best teachers who are pros in the field but also really are good at communicating. They're good at, frankly, entertaining you, too. They keep it fun. You can watch IT Pro TV anywhere on your computer, on your Roku, your Fire TV, your Apple TV. You can listen in the car. You can watch. It's, it's just the – I keep it on all day. Because there's always something to learn at IT Pro TV. They also have a wonderful free podcast, Technado. That's Don Pazette's podcast. Industry guests on there, IT news recaps. Uh, it's a great way to kind of keep up on what's going on in the world of IT. So let's make the new year a great new year for everybody with a new career in IT, with the new you know skills in IT, the best IT education around. Go to itpro.tv slash twit. The code uh, to get you 30% off forever is twit30. As long as you stay active at IT Pro TV, you get 30% off, which is unbelievably good. itpro.tv slash twit. And don't forget that code, twit30. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Thank you for supporting the Tech Guy Show. IT Pro TV, Don and Tim and the gang. And, and thank you for supporting the Tech Guy Show by using that address so they know you saw it here. That's itpro.tv slash twit. The offer code twit30. IT Pro TV. He's got a steering wheel the size of a coffee can lid. His car <laughs> keeps going up and down and up and down. <laughs> but he looks darn cool driving it. It's time for our car guy, Sam Abul Samad. Hey, am I saying your name right? Somebody in the chat room says, you keep saying yes. Sam's name wrong. No, no, that's the way I generally pr pronounce it. it. I mean, I guess you could say Abu El Samid. Uh, yeah, te technically <laughs> that is the the closer to the correct pronunciation or more accurate pronunciation. Yeah. But if you were, yeah, you, know, you would say that if you were speaking to me in Arabic. Yeah. But then I wouldn't understand what you're saying anyway. <laughs> right. so it, Abu El Samid. Yeah. It's just I yeah. just kind of lead it all together. Anyway, you know him as Sam, yeah. our car guy. He's the principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights, and of course does that great Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media and joins me every week to talk. This was the big news this week, Mercedes and their giant screen. When I saw that they were putting a 56-inch screen inside their car, I thought, wow, I might sit in the car to watch movies, but it's not like that, is 
Uh, well, it, it could be if you were sitting on the passenger side, but this is the uh, they uh, later this year Mercedes is going to launch their new EQS, which is their new um, flagship electric sedan, uh, S class style electric sedan, and they've started teasing out details of it. And so every week or two, probably for the next several months, we'll be seeing more details of the EQS. But the first one this week was the what they're calling the hyper screen. Uh, and they're referring to it as a 56-inch screen because it spans the entire dashboard of the car. Basically, the entire dashboard is one giant sheet of uh, uh, compound glass, you know, compound curved glass. Uh, but it's not actually one 56-inch display. Um, it's actually there's actually three separate displays under the the surface of the glass. There's an LCD display in front of the driver for the the cluster, the instrument cluster. And then um, in the center and on the left or on the right hand side for the passenger, there are a pair of OLED displays, OLED displays. And uh, they're, they haven't said the exact dimensions of each of the individual displays, but the, the center one looks from the, the photos they've distributed to be somewhere around 18 to 20 inches across. Wow. Um, and then... And then the passenger side display has some filtering in front of it so that it's not really visible from the driver's side. So the passenger can actually uh, sit there and watch movies if they want, or uh, they can also interact with the, the nav system or the so media you could, controls. So you could watch movies, huh? They wouldn't be. You could I mean, from, from the passenger side. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It would be more like a little TV in front of the passenger, though. I mean, 50 Yeah, it's... it's it, it's probably going to be about a 10, 10 to 12 inch display right. over still, in front of the passenger. Yeah. It's what I like is with a, with a soft screen like that, you can change controls and so forth. You can have it be what you want. That, that is true. And you'll certainly be able to do that to some degree with the, the large center display and, and also with the, with the instrument cluster. Right. Um, but one of the interesting things they talked about with this is a concept they call zero layer. Um, you know, by having this really big central display, you know, one of the challenges with touchscreens and cars is, you know, you've got to, you're drilling down through menus all the time, which is takes your attention away from the road. Uh, you know, so it's actually a really bad interface design for the vehicle. Uh, so what um, what they've done is they they've got this concept of zero layer, where they're trying to surf, bring everything that you need all the time or that you're going to want most of the time to the top layer, the top surface. So you're not drilling down. And, you know, similar concept to what Ford did with the Mach-E interface, you know, where you have, you know, all the stuff that you're using on a regular basis at that top layer all the time, you know, either in the, the main window or in the carousel just below it. And Mercedes is doing something uh, conceptually similar. Graphically, it's a little different from Ford's approach, but conceptually the same kind of thing. So, you, you know, in this case, you know, one of the images they released shows the, the navigation map, you know, taking up the entire, almost the entire display, most of the display, the climate control below that, and then some um, kind of like widgets sitting on top of the map, you know, look, look, looking very much like uh, the new iOS widgets, um, where, you know, you've got a widget for the media control, you know, to play and pause and fast forward, another one for the phone, another for messages. So you have all this stuff at your disposal right away. So you're not going down through menus, which should make it a lot better. And yet I always worry with a compelling, beautiful screen that that takes your eyes off the road. And is that a little bit dangerous, right? If the screen is too cool and has too much information, that worries me a little bit. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the other things that they will have in here um, in this vehicle, and they also have in the new um, the new standard S class, is what they're calling an augmented reality heads up display. Uh, so you know this is a, a multi layer heads up display that you know is projecting information in front of you. So things like uh, your speed, turn signals, um, you know those are at one level that kind of floats out, you know, somewhere towards the end of the hood. You know, it appear it looks like it's you know hanging out around the end of your hood. And then a second layer behind that where they're projecting things like um, the navigation prompts and actually just making it look like it's actually on the road. Um, so you know, with this, you, you're 
less likely to be looking down at the screen because it's out in front of you and showing you uh, the, you know, this is where you need to turn. Yeah, you know, I like that heads up stuff. More or less. Yeah. Yeah at, yeah, at the position where, so it looks like it's out, you know, at the at the intersection where you're actually supposed to be turning rather than, you know, closer to you. So it's, yeah. uh, I, I've yet to try one of these in person, but, you know, again, they, they sound really interesting. Now, well, also, uh, somebody in the chat room is asking this. It, it, these screens are sensitive to direct sunlight. Is there, do you have a hood you could put over it or something if you leave your car in the sun? Um, so... No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, you know, so far, most of the most of the screens, you know, most automakers have been really good about getting screen technologies, display technologies that can hold, withstand the heat. Uh, yeah. There is there has been one notable exception that has had some challenges with, um, you know, some of the the displays actually, you know, delaminating and and starting to fail because of the the solar load that they get. Uh, yeah. Uh, exposed to, um, but we won't talk about Tesla this week. Um, <laughs> really? Did but, that happen? Uh, oh, man. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, the displays on the Model S and the Model X were really bad because oh. they were not they were not designed as automotive grade. They, they <sighs> took some industrial components. Right. Um, so most manufacturers, you know, try to make sure they're, they're getting parts that can withstand the, the rigors of being in a vehicle. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'll be curious to see how this one actually looks like, you know, just from glare. You know, glare is an issue. And some manufacturers do a better job with that. Uh, Toyota, some of their, a lot of their displays they use have a lot of problems with glare. Same with Nissan. Uh, but Kia and Hyundai actually do a great job. You know, just they choose different display technologies that work a lot better and are much more visible. So the... You know, we'll see how these OLEDs actually work out in the vehicle. Does is Mercedes do, do this for the cool factor? I mean, do, you're replacing a lot of buttons, dials, and gauges. There are some people, especially in German vehicles, who who like having physical gauges and stuff. I'm one of those people. Yeah, I'd rather have physical controls yeah. for most of the so stuff. So, are they doing this um, for cost savings? I can't think that they are. It must it must really just be because that's the hot new thing, right? It, 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 it's a bit of both. Um, you know, the cool factor is definitely a big thing, but, uh, you know, it also costs a lot of money to engineer and manufacture those, those buttons and switches and, you know, having the wiring to all of those, you know, so, so it is harder to make. It is actually cheaper to yeah, go yeah. display only. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, would you, plus it gives would, flexibility to change the interface. I well, the, and nowadays we're seeing, you know, for years, cars did not get updated. Your Miata has not had a firmware update. Since since it came out ever. in the nineties, ever, <laughs> yeah. But uh, nowadays, people have that kind of expectation that there'll be over the air updates and so forth. And so, having a screen, and this can, will have that. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. How much will this car start at? Just at it. Um, probably somewhere around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, good. I don't even have to worry about thinking <laughs> about <laughs> yeah. it. Sam Ebel Samad, principal researcher, Guidehouse Insights. His podcast is at wheelbearings dot media and he joins us every week to talk about automotive tech and there sure is a lot to talk about with that leo laporte the tech i thank you sam have a great week stay warm you too leo what was what you say 17 degrees in ypsilanti it was it was 17 this morning when i went to walk daisy what do you wear chillier. what do you wear it's, when it's 17 degrees is it is it a puffy down jacket T-shirt and shorts usually works pretty well. <laughs> That's right. You're a Michigander. Hey, I, I've grown up. You're used I've grown to up this. in this environment. You're used to it. 17's warm. As long as it's above, as long as we're in double digits, it's it's cool. No, I, yeah, I've got a nice winter jacket, a, a hoodie. You know, I wear a couple of layers. Yeah. I remember, uh, I think probably the coldest I ever was, was it was five degrees in Toronto. And you didn't even want to breathe because your tongue would hurt from the, the, the coldness of the air. The, the coldest I've ever experienced was in International Falls, Minnesota, um, when I was doing winter testing uh, as an engineer. And uh, one day it was 41 below zero, standing out in the middle of the lake. And that was without the wind chill. <sighs> That's awful. <laughs> that was cold. That's cold. I haven't experienced that, uh, and I don't ever yeah. hope to. No, that's. Yeah. <laughs> There's some car ad. I wish I can't even remember the model, but they're driving. They're doing winter testing. They're driving through the snow and the ice and stuff. And I'm thinking, oh man, that's not a job I would want. I didn't know it was you driving that car. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, because it's safe. Blasting around on a, on a frozen lake. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, one one of our regulars, Tim Stevens, does that. Uh, he races ice. Yeah, he goes ice racing. Ice racing. You know, yeah. Tim. Which, yeah, he's got his old Subaru WRX yeah. and puts some yeah. studded tires on there. Crazy. <laughs> I, I, I first saw people doing that when I was in northern Sweden in the early 90s. It's, it's hysterical to watch. Eesh. It's crazy because you're still slipping and sliding despite the studs, right? I mean, um, a lot less. You yeah. still there is still some sliding, but yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot less. Wow. I mean, you you can actually with the studs, you can actually get some some grip on the ice. Okay. It's it's a it's and pretty I amazing to watch. It's cool because it probably is a lot of skill required to to. Oh do yeah, that. absolutely. You, know, you it, have to it, have a, it takes very. It takes very different skill set yeah. driving in that yeah. kind of environment than it does yeah. to drive on a, on a dry track. You can see why he's hooked on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, while, while you're while you're still on, make sure you watch the Expanse. Listen to Robert and follow. I Robert watched the and, first and episode and I loved it. It what I hadn't watched something else that I thought was the Expanse. I loved it. I love the it's, the, it's, the noir feel. It's like the Blade Runner. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The, the the story, you know, and one of the cool things about it is the physics. You know, they've done an mm. amazing job trying to get realistic physics. I couldn't believe how good the zero gravity effects are. I don't know if they're underwater yeah. or what they're doing, but the hair. I, I don't know what they're doing, but doing it's, this it's and, really well done. Yeah, and and the story is great, and the character development, and you, as you watch those core characters develop over the course of, we're now into season five, and there's one I more know. season coming. I know. Um, you know. You, you see those characters evolve, and it's it's pretty amazing. I watched the first episode without Lisa just to see if it was any good, and I said, "Lisa, we got to watch this." But I can't watch the second episode until she catches up. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm kind of I'm kind of stalled right now. We're, I may just say, we're, "Lisa, I'm watching this." I don't, you know. We're we're actually glad that this year they're parceling them out one episode a week because yeah. it forces us. We don't, yeah. <laughs> you Can't know, because there's it. only ten episodes a season. Yeah, and so it it makes it last a little it's longer. Pretty easy to watch a season a day if you really go uh, crazy. <laughs> as long as you got a catheter last year and we some watched food it. supplies, you're good. Last year we watched the ten episodes in the, about three days. So oh, wow, I've done that on a really good show. Yeah. I've done that. actually it's a great way to watch. All right, Sam, stay right. warm. Take care. Talk to you. Take next care. Bye bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO. We were talking to Mario at the beginning of the hour about 3D TVs, and I apparently incorrectly said uh, they're not making them anymore. I thought that that was the case, and it is true. I don't think there are any more direct view 3D TVs, but Demos came in the chat room and said, whoa, 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 there are still some projectors that offer 3D. And uh, he mentioned specifically the, uh, the Epson cinema the home cinema series now i'm looking and i don't see it's, it's certainly not every model i see some uh, uhds which is great but i don't see any specifically saying 3d but anyway that'd be worth checking we'll put a link in the uh, show notes at techguylabs.com nice thing about a projector is it's big you know you can make the screen pretty much as big as you want the bad thing, of course, is it's dim, so you have to be able to darken the room. But uh, I think big and 3D is a good combination, I would guess. So uh, thank you, uh, Demos, for hustling into the chat room and giving us that update. I appreciate it. 8888-ASK-LEO, the number on the line next. Uh, looks like Sabine from Louisville, Kentucky. Hello. Is it Sabine or Sabin? Uh, Sabin. C- Sabin. Hello, Sabin. Hello. Welcome. What can I do for you? Um, I'm actually looking for recommendations on a all-around mic for like recording and video calls. That's yeah. Durable. Yeah. Nowadays, we're all becoming broadcasters, aren't we? With living on Zoom and for all our work meetings and so forth. And you know, even today, when I watch. You know, uh, news channels and sports, and they've got the commentators at home. Half the time they're using the worst, you know, their AirPods or something like that for the microphone. And you really can tell. But occasionally you'll get a contributor. Uh, I I noticed the uh, governor of Michigan was on the other day and she had a lapel mic. Obviously, somebody had set her up with kind of a pro setup. And you certainly can. The thing you're going to look for on this is a microphone that has a USB connection. Professional microphones, the kind I use here at the radio station and stuff, uh, require, they, they have an unusual interface 
that are designed for mixers, not for connecting to computers. You could buy one. I use uh, microphones from Heil Sound, the PR40, and get. But you then need to get an interface that you plug it into that converts it to USB, so you could plug it into your computer. Once it's USB, Zoom, Teams. Google Meet, they'll all recognize it as an input. You know, as long as your operating system sees that USB mic, which almost always they do, it's it usually doesn't require anything, a special driver or anything, uh, those programs will work with it fine. You don't have to spend a lot of money. My suggestion, uh, because of uh, th this is a company that supports podcasters who are usually <laughs> broke, <laughs> don't have a lot of money, but they make really, I think, very good USB uh, microphones um, for that connect right to the computer is a company called Rode, R-O-D-E, Rode.com. And actually, I've used Rode on my cameras and in a variety of situations, uh, I think, very successfully. I think they really do a good job. Um, you don't buy them on Amazon. In fact, there's a big announcement on Rode's uh, site that you shouldn't you shouldn't buy it on Amazon because those are third parties that are selling it. But they have a variety of really good studio quality microphones, like their NT USB Mini. Uh, they have a Pod mic, and their range of prices is uh, pretty broad. There are a lot of uh, you know it's a broad enough price range that you could find. You know, the NT USB Mini is ninety nine bucks. You're going to spend probably a hundred bucks to get a decent mic. Uh, Rode is less expensive than some other companies like BLU, E Blue, um, and I think the Rodes are very good. So I would take a look at the, the Rode NT USB Mini. I will put a link in the show notes at TechGuyLabs.com uh, to the page at Rode, and they have a link to from there to a bunch of other uh, places. Audio Technica makes excellent mics. The ATR twenty one hundred. A lot of people like to use that for podcasting. All of these will be great for Zoom. They'll, and they'll sound so much better. And your and your coworkers will say, "What are you doing, Saban? What are you doing? That sounds so good. You're so clear." I do all of my um, my teleconferences uh, at home in front of my computer with one of these Heil mics. I have an interface, and I plug it in, and I wear big old radio headphones. <laughs> and I know I probably look, and the microphone's right in my face. I probably look pretty go goofy. But uh, I have to say, for me, having better audio quality is, is really worth it. Uh, the microphone, particularly what most people do is they use a camera and the microphone on their laptop or desktop. Uh, and while the cameras on Windows PCs are pretty good, they're not very good on Macs, the microphones are omnidirectional and pick up a lot of room tone or echo. And uh, I, you really want something that you can put close to your face. A lot of people, even when they get good mics, they'll put them far away because they don't want to see it on the camera. But you see how I sound far away? I don't sound as good. It's much better to be uh, close to the mic. So don't be shy. Show in your mic. Show off your mic. It's okay. Let's go to Twin Falls, Idaho. Dave's on the line. Hi, Dave. Hi, Leo. How you doing? I'm great. Welcome. What can I do for you? Um, I got a, a, a question here. I've got a effect based on your recommendations. I bought an EcoTank printer a few years back. Good. Absolutely the best printer I ever had. Nice. Epson's not a sponsor I, anymore, but good. I'm glad you like it. Well, I yeah. agree. I mean, I knew that they were a sponsor. I didn't. I didn't yeah. know they were not now, but yeah. You know, just letting you know, it's the best printer I've ever had. But, good. Um, I was wondering. Now, I don't print near as much as. I used to. I just do so much online. I, you know, I just don't print like I used to here at home. And if I sometimes five weeks, six weeks might go might go by before I print another page. I, it's like it's drying out or something. Yeah. So it takes me. It literally takes me a half hour of. Running, yeah, through, cleaning the printer heads and doing all this is that. this is the problem uh, with inkjet. Um, if you don't use it a lot, the ink dries in the heads. Now I've talked to the Epson about this; they hated it. In fact, I, it may be one reason they don't advertise anymore. Because I would usually tell people if you don't print at least a few times a week, you should probably get a laser printer instead. Yeah, because inkjets tend to clog. 
And unless you use them regularly, keep that ink flowing, they'll dry out. Now, Epson told me, oh, no, 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 it doesn't happen on ours because we coat the heads, et cetera. But I've had it happen, I, and obviously you have too, and, I, and I've talked to enough people. Yes. It's just, it's a, it's a natural consequence. How, how often do you print? Um, well, I mean, sometimes it's a couple times a week, but like I said, sometimes a five weeks, six weeks. Yeah, that's when, when you're going to get. Yeah, that's when you're going to get clogged, and then they have a routine yes. that unclogs the heads. But as you say, it, it takes a while, and it uses a lot of ink too because it's spraying ink through those nozzles to loosen up the clogs. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could I could see a difference from when I go through that you know thirty minute routine of of unclogging everything. I could see a difference in the ink ink yeah. levels. This, despite the fact that the printer is really good on ink, but I was what I was wondering. I guess my question was, do you know? Because I have um, iPhones and iPads. It's pretty much that's what I have here at home. Do you know of a way to automatically print a oh. test page? I know <laughs> just on once, Windows, like once a week, on. just print something out. Yeah. I actually switched yeah, to laser. <laughs> I switched to an inexpensive brother laser because I just didn't. We don't nowadays. People don't print as much as they used to, right? I mean, paperless yeah. office is coming, so that's what I did. I'm very happy with a, a brother uh, laser printer. But I, yeah, you probably could have a shortcut that you know on your iPhone that would print a page once in a while. I don't think that would be too hard to do. Let me think on that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, I do appreciate your time. Yeah, no, well, uh, don't don't leave. I just had to wrap because of the top of okay. the hour. Um, yeah. I would bet you could write a shortcut. I don't know. I haven't looked at that. You know, I'm not the shortcut wizard. We have a few on the network, but I'm not the shortcut wizard. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Mike B has found something on the Internet. Our chat room is often quicker on the draw than I am. Uh, how to automate pr printing a test page once a week. Now this is there's a Windows answer which is not the not the best answer. Oh um, no! Yeah, uh, I, these are all Windows uh, answers. Um, I, I've done my homework. I've looked. I've looked around. I've tried to find. I mean, there's nothing in the app itself. I've looked around. I found all kinds of Windows things. Nothing for iOS. And um, yeah, iOS has maybe. this automation uh, tool called Shortcuts. And. Um, I'm going to check right here to see if shortcuts has a print command because you could, if it does, that's, that's the key. You need a print command. If it did, you could easily have it. Uh, I, could, I could automate. Yeah. You could automate it yeah. on a schedule. Like you could even have it when I leave the house, print a test page, things like that. Yeah. Um, because right now all I did was I, I put, uh, um, a dopey thing in my reminders. Do you, you do, know? Yeah. Do you only have iOS? No do you have what. a Mac or a PC or just iOS stuff? No, just, just I, iOS. Just yeah. iOS. Yeah. Some. It, iPad, it would be easy to do on a Mac, um, but on, I'm trying to think of how you would do this on iOS. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, let me see. Mike has found another. Another discussion on Apple because it would require the capability in shortcuts. Um, yeah, I see a lot of ways to do it on on uh, on a desktop, but not on iOS. So I'm not. I just okay. don't. I I will keep looking for you. Keep listening. Uh, we put it in the show notes if we can find it. Um, you, you, Dr. Mom says, well, and she's our Echo expert. If you had it, have an Amazon Echo, you could have a print command that would say, you know, Echo, print a test page, and it would automate that. That's a step ahead of having and to open I, up the phone. Know, I guess I could, you know, I mean, something like that, but... I, I know what you want. I understand. You just want something that... Lazy. Every Monday. Yeah, because you forget. I understand. Every Monday, yeah. just just prints it out. The thing about a laser printer is the color is not going to be as good. So if you really like color printing, you need an inkjet, especially photo printing. Mm -hmm. You need an inkjet. Um, mm -hmm. Let me think. Uh, you can schedule shortcuts. It's not a question of scheduling. The chat room's coming up with solutions. It's a question of does shortcuts, can you automate a print command? 
And that's the that I know we could trigger it, but it it has to have the ability to print. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're gonna keep working on it. Keep keep. I did, I don't have an answer off the top of my head, Dave, but we'll find it. All How right. is it freezing in Twin Falls? Are you dying? It's thirty four degrees outside. Oh, it's, it's a little windy. It's but balmy. Thirty four degrees this time of year. That's so, not bad. That's balmy. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was I was also curious. Um, how your son's drone endeavors are going? Oh, he's having uh, so much fun. He's got a page now, HenryLaporte.com. But he's but I made a mistake because he said I want an FPV. You know what those are? No, those are the racing drones that you have to wear a virtual reality visor. Oh, 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 yes, because they have yes, a camera okay. on them, and you you're riding in the drone. He want he has a he put a, put wants to put a GoPro on it. Because that's when you can get really dramatic footage. You know, you can fly through trees and all sorts of stuff. And so I gave him uh, one for Christmas. <laughs> but he's oh. terrified. They're expensive. He's terrified about crashing it. So he's been using the simulator. He's training himself. Very smart. You can simulate it on a computer. And he says it's, it's murder. You know, he keeps crashing it. But he won't do it until he can yep. fly it uh, safely, which is pretty cool. So thank you. Are you a drone guy? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, I've got a couple drones. I've been flying for about probably close to four years now. And I went, I, I live close to the Snake River Canyon, which is just a... Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's... Hole. Evil and, Knievel tried to jump over that. I remember that. Yes. 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 And it took me a while to be comfortable taking that thing right off the edge. Oh, and man. Over <laughs> the canyon. The way I look at it, Leo, is it's a, it's a hobby and with a hobby, there's sometimes an element of risk. Yeah. I get the absolutely most beautiful footage oh, of so cool. Snake River Canyon. Oh, I and bet. And the Perrine Bridge. And, oh, I bet. And it's just, this is a great area to live in um, if you have a drone. And, I, I and love Idaho. I agree. I've driven through it. It's beautiful, beautiful country. Yeah. Yeah. How so fun is that? He's doing good. Do you post your videos anywhere? Um. I don't. I've sent them to friends, but I, I, I really don't. And I, and I have a nice collection that I really should. I have posted them on uh, on a Mavic forum oh, uh, nice, nice. before, but nothing for just, yeah. you know, general public. But I've got two drones. I've got an older um, Mavic Pro, and then I have a Phantom. So while we've been talking, the chat room's been working. Apparently... There is a print command in Shortcuts. So download Apple's Shortcuts app on your iPhone. And it, uh, it, it, we'll put a link in the show notes to at least one print uh, shortcut that you could add. And then you could easily tie it to some event. For instance, when I leave the house, print a diagnostic page, that kind of thing. So uh, I think it's doable. I think it's doable. All right. I will work with it. I so much appreciate your time and I appreciate the people in the chat. Lovely. Thanks for calling, Dave. Take care. Thank you, sir. See you. Bye. Bye. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Hour number two of the Tech Guy Show, where we talk about computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smart watches and printing and printers and all that jazz 3d tvs 8888 ask leo is the phone number 888-827-5536 that's toll free from anywhere in the u.s or canada you can use skype to call me from everywhere else we want to hear from you thanks to the internet listeners all over the world i love that the website where we uh, put links to things like how to print from my inkjet every week from my ios device and i think we found some good answers those go up at techguylabs.com techguylabs.com 8888 ask leo again the phone number back to the oh and chris markward our photo guy's coming up in just a little bit uh but back to the phones we go to rhode island and chris is on the line hi chris hey leo sorry for hitting you the second day in a row but this hit, hit me man topic. hit me hit me what's up <laughs> There's an important topic I think you're uniquely qualified to unpack for society. Um, with the turbulent times we're in, and there's a lot of people that are full of anxiety and yes. fear. Yes, as am I. Yes. Um, 
And I think between you, Dr. Mom, maybe Georgia Dow, you could put together a show, a segment for how people can get help Cope. online. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't feel qualified to do that. I mean, um, uh, of course, we have people like Georgia Dow, who's a, a, a licensed therapist on our shows regularly. Um, you know, I, I I have to be careful because. I'm a know-it-all, and I tend to, I tend to want to talk about everything, and uh, I've got to really limit myself to tech because that's that's the area of expertise that I uh, I've been doing for the last forty years, and uh, I mean I know a little bit about mental health yeah. because of course almost every family uh, has experienced mental health issues either personally or with family members, and so as have I, and so I do know a little bit about it. And like, uh, like I think most people, this has been a tough, tough year, and it's been very stressful. And uh, I agree, uh, we need resources. There, there is lots of help out there, uh, but you know, uh, I wish there were more. Frankly, um, well, I, I, th I think that you could your your portion of it would be to explain how to get to those resources. Yeah, yeah, not the resources themselves. Let Georgia and Dr. Ma. I agree. Actually, I agree. There is a, a website I would recommend. Yeah, there is a website I'd recommend. Mentalhealth.gov. Mentalhealth.gov, uh, which has uh, links to veterans' crisis lines, suicide prevention lines, where you can get immediate help. Um, you know, I would certainly start there. If you have a physician, uh, of course, uh, even a general practitioner, uh, they can they can help as well. And honestly, uh, we are in a, a really anxious time, um, mm -hmm. and it is it is very very difficult for all of us. You know, if we're if you're lucky enough to have a pet and a, and a spouse or a, uh, a roommate or somebody that you can talk to and lean on, that's great. But if so many of us are not. Uh, you know we're alone and uh, and it's hard. It's really hard. We have employees who haven't been into work in a long time, and I know some of them live alone, and it's very stressful for them. And I really, I really feel uh, for you and and everybody else. And I, uh, I just don't feel fully qualified to delve into that. But let me talk to Georgia when she's on, and you've probably seen this. She actually oh, gives yeah. gives out her uh, email address for people who are struggling, uh, kind of volunteers. Uh, to, to be there for them. And she now has, and I would recommend this, her own YouTube channel dealing with mental health issues. And she's great. She has a series of videos um, to help you deal with a lot of things like that. Um, but let me, let me point you to... You've already, you've already started. This is, I'm a community chaplain also. Ah, wonderful. And, so you're dealing with this you, too. With, yeah. I, I, get, I have too much business. Yeah, isn't it sad? It's so hard. George has um, got a new uh, a new YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to YouTube and search for Georgia Dow, uh, mm -hmm. she's going to be starting to put up videos on exactly these issues. She's very well aware. Now she's unfortunately she's in Canada, so if you're if you're not in Montreal, you can't see her in person. But she has been. I think she's going to be very helpful. I know that she is really wants to work uh, with people, and I love it that you're you're doing this. This chaplaincy, I'm sure that you're acting in, in many cases, uh, pastors uh, are are often the first line of defense because, you know, who else are you going to talk to? So I think that's a wonderful thing. that well, you're you, doing. you can't see people in person. <laughs> Isn't that hard? And I think that's a, a lot of the reason we're feeling this anxiety. You, you want a hug, you know, mm -hmm. you want a hug. And uh Thank goodness we have, uh, we at least we have Zoom and FaceTime and, and these other ways. I talk to my mom every week. She's in Rhode Island, as a matter of fact. And uh, and FaceTime is a lifesaver. And we've said that many times because I can't visit her, but I can at least talk to her and uh, see her and she can see me. And I think that that's better than nothing. It's not a hug. <laughs> we need to find a way to do virtual hugs. <laughs> But it's better than something. Thank you for uh, Chris thank, for, for thank stepping up. Much. It's a great question. Thank you for the work you're doing uh, with with your people. Um, I think that's the other You've thing. You've already is, done more than I could ever do. Well, I don't know about that, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's a great question. And technology doesn't have a great answer, unfortunately, because uh, it's the opposite, isn't it? It's uh, 
it's um, they used to be uh, a phrase. Who was it coined? I think Alvin Toffler, way back in the seventies, he wrote a book called Future Shock, and he called about he talked about something called high tech, high touch, or maybe it was John it was John Nesbitt. He actually wrote a book called High Tech, High Touch, Technology in Our Search for Meaning. He was a guy who wrote Megatrends. You might remember that. And uh, he, this is when, this is, when did this come out? In the 70s, I think. No, 99. He said, we are uh, in a technologically intoxicated zone. This is 21 years ago he wrote this confusing and distracted state where we both fear and worship technology, where we see technologies as toys and quick fixes and where we become obsessed with what is real and what is fake. Does that sound familiar? We, you know, I think a lot of uh, deep thinkers have been concerned about this as we dive down this well of technology, that we start to lose our human connections. And uh, this is a good book, High Tech, uh, High Touch. And given even that it was written 21 years ago, I think it's still fairly timely. These are the people like uh, Nesbitt was thinking about this stuff uh, decades ago. Decades ago. It's a fascinating uh, subject, really kind of outside my uh, purview. And yet, since w what we talk about is technology, I think more and more... In uh, my conversations on our podcasts, on this show with people, uh, we've talked about the consequences of our high-tech environment. There's a lot of good, an awful lot of good we get from it. And I don't know if this quarantine, this pandemic would have been as easy to get through had we not been able to communicate using Zoom and and, and some of us working from home, uh, you know, it would have been a lot tougher without the technological resources that uh, this century offers us. And yet at the same time, it's not all uh, cake and candies. There's, there's some bad side effects as well. We're seeing some of that too. 8888 Ask Leo. I, I, it's not exactly in my purview, but I'm certainly well aware of it. And, uh, and I'm certainly open to talk about it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo, let's go uh, a little closer to home. In fact, just up the road a piece. Jeff's on the line from Santa Rosa. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Leo. Uh, thanks for doing your show. I enjoy it a lot. Thank you for listening. I, I really <clears throat> appreciate it. Yeah. Dignation turned me on to it. Oh, wow. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see Kevin Rose's tweet a couple of days ago? No. He, he said, I hate what they're doing with Dig. Dig got sold. And, and uh, he says, I hate what they're doing with Dig. I am offering the current owners of Dig, his old news site, a million dollars, which is four times what they paid for it. I will buy it. I will take it back to version two. Now, uh -huh. I would love to see Kevin and Alex bring back Dig Nation, which was their podcast. The yeah. whole idea of their yeah, podcast. Dig, Dig was like a kind of... It's not exactly Reddit. It was a news site where people would upvote and downvote, and so you'd see the things people were most interested in, kind of like Slashdot, which is older and still around. Uh, but it went through some tough times. People gamed it. That was the biggest problem Dig faced. And uh, Kevin eventually sold it off, and and it's not been... Yeah, they had, they had some APIs that were real functional as yeah. like live streaming. Yeah, he's a smart guy. He was a mm -hmm. really is a really smart guy. He's, uh, you know, the good news is uh, he made some money, I imagine, selling Dig, but made more money because he was an early investor in Twitter. And uh, he, so he's doing all right. He's a venture capitalist now, investing uh, in, in startups, and apparently has a million dollars to spend to uh, save <laughs> Dig. I, I would love that. I would love to see yeah, that. Me yeah, me too. Yeah. Anyway, the, the reason I called, I bought my wife a Chrome box. Yes. For a desktop. Yeah. And it's it's about four years old. She loves it because it starts up quick. The updates are seamless. Yeah. And it's secure, and most it, importantly. Yeah. The only thing is, is right now I I looked it up and the uh, end of life. Yeah. This There's drives me crazy. Life. But they the uh, these Chrome OS devices really don't have that long. A year or two, three 
Yeah, four-year-old one would mm -hmm. be certainly out of support. Um, that just means you're not going to get new versions of Chrome OS. Are you getting what what version of Chrome? Are you getting new versions of Chrome? Okay, my my laptop, which I use at home, is up to eight point six. Eighty six. Right. Yes. Eighty six. Yep. And hers is like seventy six. Oh. Like that. So. It's probably secure. They're still, I think, doing security patches, but that's what's happening is you're not getting uh -huh. the latest version. If she's okay. comfortable using it, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, one thing that has happened is, you know, if you've got a modern Chrome box, and there are some really good ones out there, not expensive, a couple of hundred bucks, yeah. it'll be faster. It'll have more capabilities. And one of the biggest changes, although I have mixed feelings about it, you'll be able to use the Google Play Store and install Android apps on it. Okay. Yeah, because she's having troubles uh, casting to sometimes it, yeah. it drops out. That so may I'm also be. Might yeah. Cure that. yeah, I would say, okay. to, you know, go to Amazon and uh, they actually yeah. rank the Chrome boxes uh, by bestseller and I think Asus yeah. makes a very good one that uh, I, I would not hesitate to buy. And it really is. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, the nice thing about um, Chrome OS devices is there's a direct correlation between the price and the power. And so you can get a Chrome box from Asus for 230 bucks or 560 bucks, And the difference will be the processor, the amount of memory, the amount of storage, that kind of thing. But I think that somewhere in that price range are some very nice choices. Yeah, because her the one she has now it runs just fine. Yeah, I know it's one of the things that bothers me about Chrome OS, and I'm not sure why Google does that. I guess, I guess they just don't feel like they can continue to support the older hardware. I'm thinking. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, but if you got if you got one of the more expensive Chromeboxes with eight gigs of RAM and an Intel processor you know, the i3, you'd have uh -huh. significant jumps in performance. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wouldn't spend 800 okay, bucks on it. They have i7 versions, yeah. but I, I wouldn't go that <laughs> far. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, if you get maybe the mid-range ones around $500, that's really going to give you a nice machine. And again, in another three or four years. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, because it seemed like I'd get another five years if I looked if I bought this one for like 300 and Yeah, I think you will. You should look. They Google, the good news is, publishes the end-of-life schedule for all of this mm -hmm. stuff, so you'll have some idea. And I feel like they've added some years. So the thing is, don't worry. It's still secure. It'll still operate just fine. You just, and, it, I, and you confirm my suspicion, you're just not getting the latest version of Chrome and Chrome OS. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I think it's a good choice. A lot. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again because I think it deserves repeating. You know, the default, most people, the default for computing is, well, I'm going to buy what I use at work or what I know everybody uses, a Windows PC. And, you know, that's probably 90% of all the PCs sold out there. The, the problem is it is a, is a, a completely general purpose system. It's designed to do whatever you want, whether it's editing text files in Notepad all the way up to designing rocket ships, creating movies. So as a general purpose operating system, it has to be kind of wide open. It has to be very capable and just kind of open to anything you want to do. The problem is it's also, as, as a result, open to anything bad guys want to do. It's much harder to secure a general purpose operating system. And we see it all the time. You know, ransomware is, is a big problem on the Windows side. Uh, you could say, well, maybe a Mac is a little more secure. I think it is, partly because it's a smaller market, but partly because Apple's done some good things to protect it. But it's still a general purpose operating system, and that's the fundamental problem. It adds complexity. It's harder to use. There's more stuff you have to figure out. And if you're using a general purpose operating system, and, and I'll include Windows, Mac OS, and Linux as well, if you're using a general purpose operating system, there is a somewhat, there's a burden on you to be a security expert, to protect yourself. You know, it's presumed, well, you have, you know, you got Windows PC, you must know how to protect yourself. And I think that's increasingly difficult for normal people. 
So I often recommend for normal people who don't need a general purpose computer, who have simple needs, they want to surf the net, do email, maybe some writing, that kind of thing, either Chrome OS or an iPad. These are intentionally designed to be simpler, much simpler, more secure. Yes, they're limited by their very nature, but that's the good part. That's the good thing. So I think for a lot of people, instead of the default, look at something simpler like a Chrome OS or iPad. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, we'll be back with more of the Tech Guy Show in just a little bit. But first, a word from our sponsor, Express VPN. It's, I'm just going to say right up front, it's the only VPN I use, the only one I recommend. These guys are trustworthy. That's the main thing. I, you know, I don't think I need to explain why you need a virtual private network you know, for a lot of reasons. But it's important that you choose one you can trust because for all those reasons, security, privacy, you, you, you know, you gotta, you're just kicking the can down the road to the VPN provider. you got to trust them and their security and their privacy. And that's why I love ExpressVPN. Protect yourself. Protect your privacy. Protect your security. ExpressVPN encrypts your Internet data. Hide your IP address. So websites, hackers, even your Internet service provider can't see what you're doing. A lot of them, a lot of ISPs keep track of where you go and they sell it for marketing reasons it's completely legal to do it but you may not want them to do that and express vpn is great too because it has an app for every possible operating system and device one button click turns it on when you turn it on you don't see this but i'm going to tell you how this works it it it, it looks for the fastest server usually that's the one nearest you but it looks for that logs into that one and as soon as it logs into that server spins up a copy of what they call trusted server. That's their server technology, their VPN server. It operates in memory, in RAM only, cannot write to the disk. It's sandboxed, completely unable to write to the disk. So no record of your visit is can be kept anywhere. And as soon as you log out, it's in RAM. It disappears. So there's no copy, no record of your visit at all. That's called privacy. Trusted server does work. And I know because they get regular audits from Price Waterhouse Cooper. They also audit their privacy policy. They say, yep, ExpressVPN, no logging. Trusted server does exactly what it says it does. Oh, there's one other thing. You can get a cheap VPN. You can get a free VPN. First of all, it's expensive to run a VPN. So if you're getting a free one, they're monetizing by, by, by tracking you. I mean, that's there's they've got to pay for it somehow. Plus, if you're getting a cheap VPN, you're not getting the best speeds because they can't afford to have, you know, uh, points of presence all over the world. ExpressVPN has, is in almost a hundred countries. They're all over the world. There's plenty of servers. They're so fast. You won't know you're running it, which is really good. You can even watch HD video. That's another reason a lot of people use it because you can choose the ExpressVPN server in England, watch Doctor Who on Netflix England or in Japan, watch all the anime. You can possibly imagine from a Netflix Japan and it's fast enough to do HD video so that's very important now it's not like ExpressVPN it breaks the bank either seven bucks a month if you take advantage of our deal you're going to get the best deal you could get so it is affordable I think it's a very fair price and you're paying enough so that they can maintain these servers maintain the speed rotate IP addresses so that you're not always using you know the same IP address it doesn't get doesn't get kind of bookmarked as an, a, a VPN IP address. They're, they're doing all the things right. This is why I use them. It's also, by the way, why CNET, Wired, and The Verge all say ExpressVPN is the number one VPN on the market. And if for any reason you say, well, that's not what I needed, they have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's really no risk. If you're looking for a VPN, and you probably should be, to protect your online privacy, to keep yourself secure, or just to watch Doctor Who... Get three months of ExpressVPN for free when you sign up for a year. So that's a 25% discount when you go to expressvpn.com slash tech guy. Three months free with a one-year package. That's the best deal. Expressvpn.com slash tech guy. I'm sure you've been thinking about a VPN. I'm sure you're curious. Maybe you want a recommendation. Uh, without hesitation, this is the one I would get. This is the one I use. Expressvpn.com. Slash tech guy. 
Oh my, I love that song. And you know why? Because it means it's time for Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. Chris is a professional photographer and helps coach people. He's, I call him my photo sensei. You can find him at S-E-N-S-E-I dot photo, sensei dot photo. And he joins us every week to help us take better pictures. It doesn't need a fancy camera. You can use your smartphone. Hi, Chris. Hey, how are you today? Happy New Year. Oh yeah, happy new year. Happy new year. Is it is it our no, it's it's our second one. Oh it's yeah, our yeah. One Never mind. Yeah, Forget it. New Year's old. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Uh, <sighs> so even, uh, even though it feels like it feels it does. like an entire year already. It, it does. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Just, let's it, talk photography. Yes. Nice let's thing to talk something about. nice. Yes. Yeah, um, I've I've looked. At, okay, so so we are at the point where you know we we've we've going um, through all the individual important concepts of photography, and the low hanging fruit is gone. Okay, so we are looking at something a bit more advanced, some some kind of well things you can do with photography, ways you can group photography, way you, ways you can you can I don't know give yourself an assignment, and one of those would be to shoot through. Things. So I've uh, gone on Flickr. I've looked through, th through pun not intended, uh, photos of other people, um, and that that illustrate that thing, the through thing, because that is a, that's amazingly versatile. There are so many different things that you can do uh, in terms of shooting through. I mean, example here on the screen is a uh, shooting through blinds. So the moment you shoot through something means you include that thing you're shooting through. So you adding a layer to the photo. And in this case, what we're looking at is uh, those blinds in the foreground and then something out of focus in the background. So that is very typical of pictures shot through things that one part is in focus, the other part is not in focus. Um, and at this point, it's your decision where you put the focus and yeah, you're cause not sure. You, with, the, with this I will, blind I will shoot picture, both. they I'll, focused on the blind. I'll shoot both. But you could yes, focus I'll, on what's I'll, through I'll the try blinds. The, yeah. I'll try what's behind it or I'll try the thing that I'm shooting Take through. Take both. This is a good example. Like. Um, this is a good example on the screen. It's a window, a, a, a child between a, a behind a window, kind of pressing its hands and face against the window. And when you're shooting through a window, you have two different kinds of glass that you can shoot through. Just plain flat glass, which will have a hard reflection. So it will add an, another layer if you include that reflection. Um, and then that, the one that we saw in this picture is texture, textured glass that you might have on, I don't know, a bathroom window or something, where whatever, the closer the subject gets to that window, the more clearly it gets. The further away it is, the more blurry it is so it's in this case the kid photo. being close I to the window it. yeah. it's a wonderful photo yeah, it's it a really beautiful is. photo there's a frame the hands make a frame and then the the face is slightly out of focus because yeah well it's a bit away from that window but everything that touches the window is is, is very clear so um yeah the type of glass that you shoot through is is wonderful um there's there's other things. I mean, you you could shoot through a hole in <laughs> in some context. I mean, here yeah, here like this. this is like some yeah. it's a wooden structure. There's uh, something behind it, and then of course, again, the question arises: What do you focus on? The thing in the foreground, the hole itself, or the material that makes the hole, or whatever is going on behind it. In this photo, I think the focus is where it needs to be. It needs to be on that big structure that does an obstruction because that's the most important thing in a photo the biggest thing in a photo but you could have a hole that is uh, like a a totally different structure let's say a big hole in a rock somewhere where uh, what's behind it is important and then you use that hole as a frame around uh what what you're taking a picture of you see this in nature like um sea arches rock arches at at the sea um are a very good example of that so um, there, I would say the hole is more of a, a framing element, not that important. But then you have a lot of distance here. So <laughs> whatever is out there beyond a certain distance tends to be in focus anyway. Um, the, 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 the difference between further away and closer in focus is much more pronounced when you're really close with things. Um, another thing to shoot through that I've found when looking, I mean, vegetation, you could shoot through a tree and maybe the sun behind it. That's um, 
Uh, we see it a lot. Another thing that I found uh, interesting is shooting through glass. This is, this shooting is through, really interesting. Yeah, because you're shooting, shooting through, through lenses. lenses. Yeah. And and you have two kinds of lenses. You have nearsighted or farsighted lenses. So um, nearsighted will uh, make things smaller through the lenses. The farsighted will make things bigger because that's more of a magnifying glass. So um, whichever way there is... Now the choice, do you focus on the glasses or on what's in focus in the glasses? Yeah, so you have yeah. a pretty similar situation. I love how but, this um, is very creative. Marion Klum is the uh, photographer. And by the way, we'll put this whole gallery up on our website so you can look at it. It's a gallery of photos Chris has chosen from uh, the photo sharing site, Flickr. But I love the creativity here because she might have just said, well, look at that pretty garden. I'll take some pictures. But instead, she thought to put her glasses on the railing and shoot the garden through the glasses, which makes it so much more interesting. It's just fascinating. Right. And it's simple. Very simple. Yeah. Um, of course, what you can do is you can shoot um, through moving things. Uh, an example I found was some sort of a waterfall thingy in a, in a, in a public swimming pool where it makes a sheet of a sheet of moving water which is like a sheet of glass but it's in motion so that makes interesting um distortions which i kind of liked um shooting through fog of sorts this photo that we're looking at here is more of an it's an artwork it's very mysterious so, because of the fog though i love that Mysterious, but then also the silhouettes in there, which take a lot of context out of it. So right. you, you, it hides things. It makes it more interesting for you. Um, and the whole silhouette thing, um, there, there are two things that. that you see as tropes in movies, and that is shooting through a, uh, through a keyhole and shooting through binoculars. And those typical things you know from the movies, the shapes they make when you shoot through. Yeah. You rarely find yeah. those in reality. Yeah. Yeah. So what they what they have to do in order to simulate that is cut them out out of black cardboard and hold them in front of the camera. Yeah. That's how you do those. So that's 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 shooting through things, and it, yeah, you, you could make an entire exhibition from that. Just shoot through things for uh, for a week, and put those into. A uh, little gallery and show. Them it's interesting because you have two planes of focus just built into the yes the the shot. You know, you have the thing that you're shooting through, and you have the thing on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's very it's interesting to play with that. Uh, yeah. uh, and and you can add a third one if it's glass. You have what's behind the glass. You have the window itself, and then you have what's reflected. So mm. you you can shoot three layers, three layers. with a with a window. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Layers. I don't. That's another topic for another day. But I like layers. In a photo, yeah. especially landscape, for some reason. I just love the layers. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris Marquardt, he's our photo inspiration. His website is sensei.photo, S E N S E I dot photo. And each uh, month he gives us an assignment. This is not a competition, there's no prize. It's just really an excuse to get out there and take pictures. It doesn't have to be with a fancy DSLR, it could be just with your your smartphone or whatever you've got, an Instamatic, whatever you got lying around. And actually, Instamatic would be appropriate for this month's assignment because we're illustrating the word, the concept, the idea of vintage. Vintage. So what does that mean to you? We're not going to say. Chris is just, it's kind of wide open. Uh, what we want you to do is take some pictures and submit uh, your best, as many as one a week for the next few weeks, to our Flickr group, the Tech Guy group at Flickr.com. It's free. Our moderator, Renee Silverman, will thank you. And in a few weeks, Chris will pick three images to uh, to review to talk about. Chris, thank you so much. Have a safe week. Stay warm, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week. Sensei.photo, Chris Marquardt. Take care, Chris. Nice. Really pretty images, lovely images this time. I just they really enjoyed them. Flickr, Flickr does a pretty good job bubbling Flickr. the good ones to the top. I love Flickr. I got to start. I haven't done any photography in a while. I got to start doing it and put some stuff on Flickr. Well, be safe. Do it in your garden. Yeah. Put my glasses yeah. on the on the railing. You too. There stay you safe. Go. Stay well. I'm glad to hear that uh, you and Monica. No, no, no COVID. Huh? That's good. We're we're good at we're good at staying. How do you do? You go shopping. How do you get food? Yeah, once a week. Once a week. Go shopping once a Wear week. Wear your masks. And at a time where there's not much going on, right. I'm double masked. 
So yeah, me too. I'm, yeah, and I'm and I sort I sort my shopping list by the aisle, so I'm in and out in no time. Smart. Yep. So, can you do takeout in uh, in your area? Is there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Every, every now and then, we we cook a lot. I mean, we're we've been cooking. I've been anyway, enjoying but, cooking. Um, actually, it's been really fun. But, cooking is fun. Yeah. We we do take out about once a week. Yeah, that's about we, right for us. Yeah. Um, but then the the yeah the the Monday the Monday afternoon shopping is kind of the the main shopping of the week. But at least There's you shopping. get out of the house, so. And I, yeah. I really miss. We live in the countryside here, so Look at it's stuff. it's. You're safe. You're good. You can go out and walk we're, around. We're we're fairly good here. Yeah. We take walks. Good. We have a garden. So nice. Yeah. Good. That's okay. All right. All right. Thank you, and have a wonderful uh, evening. We'll talk to you uh, next week. See you in a week. Thanks, Chris. Bye bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo the phone. Number. Oh, because she's young, single, and free. Is that it? Kim figured it out. Kim figured it out. Tom on the line from Warren, Ohio. Hi, Tom. Hello, Leo. How are you doing this afternoon? I am very well. How are you, sir? Oh, could be better. Could be to have a little bit of warmer weather. But yeah, this is, this is going to be a long winter, it feels like. Here comes the polar vortex next. Oy. Yeah, we've already had about 23 inches of snow over here. So. Yikes. Yikes. We're, we're dry, high and dry now, and no rain, but just a little bit of sunshine. Hey, uh, I wanted to check with you on some LEDs for TVs. You got QLED, you got ULED, you have OLED. <laughs> uh, and, and get ready because you know, this this week at CES they're going to announce QNED, QNED. So, <laughs> oh, I haven't heard of that. One. It's just out of control. <laughs> So really, there's only there's LED mania. there's only uh, right now two technologies. There's LCD screens and there's OLED screens. Right. The difference is OLEDs are emissive, so the dots are actually lights, and you're looking directly at the lights. The every other kind of screen, which includes QLED, QNED, uh, all the LED, that's not really LEDs. Those are LED backlights on an LCD screen. And the reason it's important, and QNET is going to be a big one. And Mike, by the way, mini LED, same thing, that's also an LCD screen, is they're getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper to put uh, uh, better backlights behind the LCDs. What you'd like right. is, is as many lights as possible so that you would have local area dimming so that you could have dark be darker and bright be brighter. And that's what, you know, many of these, that's what mini LED does. Um, there's also these, the Qs stand for quantum dots, which is a, just another kind of LED, frankly, with a broader range of color. Uh, nothing to get excited about. The next generation, which we saw last year at CES, nobody's going to see it this year because they're not going, but uh, they'll be talking about it, is... The uh, micro LED, which is like OLED emissive. So you're looking at such tiny LEDs, they can make up the pixels on the screen. And that is a really cool technology. So far, there's only one micro LED TV. Samsung's offering, I think, a 108 inch version. It's a mere $156,000. So, so you don't have to worry about that yet. But I, you know, I think we've talked with Scott Wilkinson about it. And I think he's, he, and most, uh, most, uh, TV people think that it's in the next five years or less, we'll start to see affordable micro LEDs. That will be the next big technology. Those can be made very, very big because they're like Legos. They you snap together multiple micro LEDs to make a screen as big as you want. So that's an interesting okay. technology. One one manufacturer. I don't know if you want to mention name. Uh, they sure. have ULED. Are yeah. you familiar with that? It's High Sense, I think. High Sense. I, I've never heard. I of think yeah. their ULED is just, you know, you can't all have the same names. <laughs> right, right. Right. It's some proprietary technology. At the it's just point. their name for basically QLED with full array local dimming. Uh, it's still an LCD. It's not an OLED. Uh, it's still an LCD. It's just they're talking about different technologies for the backlighting and as they've gotten better and better at backlighting uh it has made a difference i think i think that um they're getting close to but not quite as good as oled in in the high census case the u stands for ultra 
Ultra LED? Good. Okay. Ultra's got to be better than QLED, right? Quantum yeah. LED. <laughs> no, it's just another. Oh, I sus whatever. Yeah. I suspect it's just uh, they're talking about the, the backlight technology and whatever is proprietary I'm stuff. I'm with my OLED. I'm, I'm going to keep OLED. Oh, right so now, nothing better. I guess micro LED would be the next best thing. It might be better. Around, yeah, but I wouldn't. I would wait. Uh, not oh, merely because yeah, of the waiting. price tag, <laughs> but because there are issues with micro LED, particularly the inner the uh, the lines between the two the modules uh, sometimes are visible. We were able to see those on the uh, micro LED screens at CES in January. So that's not a good thing. And uh, uh, I think they're going to have to solve some problems. For for now, if you're willing to spend the money and you can make your room a little darker, OLED is the best picture available. Uh, if you want a brighter screen that you can keep in the living room, say, without having to pull the curtains, uh, then some of the newer LED backlight technologies are very good. You're going to see Apple's going to use micro LEDs on its iPads and its uh, computer, desktop and laptop computers uh, starting this year. So those are fairly inexpensive. You're going to see more of those uh, very soon, I think. All right, Leo, thanks. For hey, the, great uh, question. Yeah. It's really an alphabet really soup, Tom. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Stay warm. Stay safe. All right. Take care. Yeah, I think um, – I, I don't think manufacturers are helping anybody with all of these, uh, you know, QLED – ULED, ONED, and whatever else, because they're really just talking about different kinds of backlights. They're still LCDs. I think they don't want to say LCD. I think that's part of the problem. They just they just don't want to say it. But it is. It's an LCD. And so there are really only two very different technologies, LCD with varying backlight technologies and OLED. And of the two, OLED is definitely the best, uh, the best picture. Peter's in San Gabriel. He's our next caller. Hi, Peter. Hi, Leo. Uh, God bless you, and thank you for taking my call. Same to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I have a... Um, I'm going to be getting a uh, camera for my computer now. Okay. Uh, I got it from Amazon, and uh, it's the one with the cover. You cover the lens when you're not using it. So Good. Nice I privacy feature. Like yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> more and more laptops are doing that. I think it's a really good idea. And my desktop, I, I want to make a call from there uh, to do my Bible study Zoom uh, meetings on Wednesday night. Nice. But I don't have a phone. Uh, I don't have a phone list or anything. I don't know how to make calls from my computer. It doesn't. It's connected to the Internet. So I guess I have the ability to be able to make calls if I have a good app. Yeah, you need what's called a, vo a VoIP program, voice over internet protocol program, like okay. Skype. Uh, a free choice okay. that's a good choice is Google Voice. Uh, if you go to voice.google.com, voice. Voice you can set up a phone number people can call you on, and you can call other people from that phone number. And if they're in the U.S., it's free. Oh, okay. yeah. So that's a good choice. And so Google Voice. Yep. Or Skype, S K Y P E. Uh -huh. Skype uh, generally is is free to call other computers with, but uh -huh. if you're going to call landlines, they do charge you. It's a it's not it's like a penny a minute. It's not expensive, but you'll have to put some credit on your Skype account. That's a Microsoft product. Skype. Now, now, see, I I was wondering if if uh, putting my phone list on to my computer, but I've tried to put my computer onto the, I mean, my phone well, onto the computer. Yeah. You, get up that way. That's another thing. If you, it, going through. Some computers, Macs particularly, let you use your iPhone to make calls. Windows has this new feature called Your Phone that only works half the time. That'll work with Samsung devices, other Android devices. I think you're better off using a VoIP program. Take a look at voice.google.com. You just enter the phone number and it makes the call. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. I am the tech guy. Uh, this is the Tech Guy Show. As you might have imagined from that name, what we talk about is tech. It's te it's like a gardening show for technology. We talk about loam, soil, pesticides. No, no, no. We talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We talk about smartphones, smart watches, big screen TVs, all that stuff. 8888 ask 
Leo is my phone number, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. You can still call us via uh, Skype if you're outside that area, and it still shouldn't cost you a dime. Not a dime. Chris is on the line from Burbank, California, our next caller. Hi, Chris. Hey, Leo. Thank hey. you for not uh, abandoning terrestrial radio. I listen on uh, the mighty KFI. Ah, uh, yes, the mothership. You Yes, you are a true patriot of radio. They should be <laughs> worshiping you. I love radio. I got started in radio in college in 1976 and just always loved it. There's something magical about the medium. I, uh, you know, I mean, I'm a podcaster now, too, and I guess that's, in a way, that's been kind of a renaissance, at least of audio programming. There's, They've even got drama, radio drama. I mean, all of that's come back. It's just not through an antenna. But I am very glad to be working in radio still. It's well, no, they, they, and you've been part of uh, that renaissance in the medium, so they should be very thankful to you. Thank you. And I'm sure Alvin Toffler's uh, <laughs> state's very thankful. I read Future Shock when Remember I was that? years old. Oh, my gosh. Consciousness 3 and all that, yeah. Uh, yep, yep. So, and, and I think that's the beauty of your show is that you, uh, your reference point of history is... <laughs> I'm an old is, guy. <laughs> well, of course, it, but it's not paralleled and... Uh, Thank you. Simplify things. So you are doing your job in simplifying the world and making um, this crazy world of ours a little easier to navigate. So today, just a very mundane question. Uh, Google Calendar. I have a professional calendar and I have my personal calendar. I do not like toggling between the two. Right. Is there a way that I can see one calendar for myself, but uh, keep that separate from uh, the uh, my professional? Yeah. Work? So I I do actually I mushed mine together. So I have uh, you know you can have multiple calendars within Google, and I have one for my business, you know Leo job. I have one for my personal Leo personal. I also have calendars for travel and and other things. And, and you can switch them on or off, So, but you're right, that's a manual toggle. There are some programs, depends on, and I'm not sure if you're using Windows, I don't know what's out there, but on the Macintosh, I use a program called Fantastical, which is really interesting because it lets you say, when I'm at home, I want to use my personal set. When I'm at work, I want to use my work set. It actually will switch between, it allows you to create calendar sets and then switch between them based on your geographic location or time of day or a variety of other things. That's, that's very, very that's cool. That's very nice, except for the fact that you're on Windows. All, no, 90% says all work from home. Right. So, yeah, no, that's true. You don't have any the, signal. The geography, right. No, no, but no. So, how about something for like. Uh, an iPhone or an Android, because, you know, is there, can you recommend or can the chat room? Well, I th th that program, Fantastical, is also available on the iPhone and has that same feature. Uh, okay. And I don't think it has to be geographic. I, I'll have to look at it. I use geographic, but I bet you you can give it other parameters. In fact, on an iPhone, you probably even could use shortcuts to switch between ca calendars. The other way to do it uh, on, on any device would be to have two different calendar programs and have one sync to your Google business calendar and one sync to your personal calendar and then just open the program that you prefer. Uh, you know, so when you're at work, you use the pro calendar program for work. Um, you know, the, the problem, on, you know, most people just use what came with a computer. So both Mac and Windows and iOS and Android, they all have their stock calendar app. But in all four cases, there are third-party apps that you can use as well. So you could use the stock app for work and a third-party app, for instance, as your business. But it's fan, it's F -A -N -T -A -F Fantastic Al. Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I really love Fantastic Al. Uh, the, there's a free version, there's a paid version, there's a subscription version, and then you get more features, But uh, depending on what you pay. But I really think that that is the premier calendar program for iOS and macOS. I don't know when, when you know, and I'll ask the chat room if there's a recommendation, something similar, a third-party calendar app that you really like for uh, for Windows, because I'm, I'm not up on that. For Android... Um, I, you know, I think I just use the stock calendar app uh, most of the time. But again, having a third-party app would would solve that. Use you because each any calendar app will let you turn on or off Google calendars depending on what you want. Yeah. Well, listen. Uh, have a great 2021. 
Keep I'm doing my going. best. It's not yeah, starting so going, good. Brother. <laughs> All right, my friend. It's good to talk to you. Thanks for calling, so Chris. Long. All Bye. right, take care. Yeah, that you know, it's. I think in in one way, when when companies like Apple and Microsoft provide stock apps on their operating system, uh, you know, they're providing a functionality that you know everybody uses calendars, everybody uses address books, so they're providing a needed functionality. But I also think it's a bad thing because it reduces the market for a third party solution, you know, and uh, and so I think. There's something to be said for, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm fighting uphill, an uphill battle. But I, it would be nice if these companies did not do that, <laughs> just to encourage developers to come up with alternatives. Because I guess the rationale that Microsoft and Apple and Google use is, well, we're not going to give you a great calendar app, just an okay one. That's how we'll handle it. Then there'll be incentive for developers to come up with great ones. And I, I guess that's, I guess that works. Fantastic Hell is a great one, but they just maybe it'd be nice to have a bigger variety of choices. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Walter, Palm Springs, California is next. Hi, Walter. Yes, uh, Leo from yes, uh, Screensavers. Yes, way back when. Yes, way back when, Leo. The good old days when my hair was still brown. Yeah, uh, me too. Me too. Uh, yeah, I got a, a kind of a weird problem. I bought a computer from a guy that. Um, well, that's not a good the, uh, start, by the way. I bought a computer from a guy. Go ahead. Well, uh, he the CD-ROM went out, and all he liked to do was watch um, movies on it. So yeah. he didn't want the computer anymore. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. But he wrote. He was the administrator on the computer. Uh, he wrote the name. On, on a piece of, to the front of the computer. Now, after that, I ran the computer maybe four or five times using his administrator name, and it worked fine. Now I type in the administrator name, and it won't turn on. Got it. Oh, so he didn't. It was so okay. So there's different ways you can password protect a PC. There is a way so that you can't even boot it without the password. Are you saying it won't even start without the password? Well, it comes on where it shows, you know, where to put in the password. So it gets to Windows, but just not, well, you can't. Yeah, I guess. So, because if it's just, if it's getting to Windows, then that's an easy fix. And probably what you should have done on day one, you don't know what he's got on that hard drive. You should yeah. get a copy of Windows, wipe out the hard drive and install a new version fresh with your administrator account on it. Now you're going to lose... Yeah. What you're gonna part of the reason people do this is well, hey, I've got Office installed and all this stuff, and you can use it for free, but you don't have a legit license. Uh, there's there's always the threat that he's left other crap on there that you may not want, like spyware, malware, who knows? So it's always when you buy a used computer, always the best policy to format the hard drive, wipe that sucker off, and install a fresh copy of Windows. Um, now, if he has locked the BIOS, if he's locked it so that you can't even access the drive, that's another matter entirely. And those, uh, frankly, are very, very difficult to override. Um, there probably are ways to do it depending on where that lock is. But if it's just a Windows password you're lacking, I think this is an opportunity. 90 bucks, buy a copy of Windows. Truthfully, right now, I think that you can use Windows for free for 10 months. So through halloween so <laughs> go maybe maybe now's the time to download a copy of windows and be and test it for 10 months and then when the 10 months comes up you either buy it or you start over or something but yeah get it's really good idea to get rid of that entire operating system that's a risk having that on there you don't know what he left on there yeah, and I think a lot of times people think, oh, I got this great deal. The guy had everything installed. I don't have to buy Photoshop. I don't have to buy anything. Yeah, besides that being ethically sketch, it's fraught with peril. Fraught. Uh, our show today, the other thing, by the way, if you want to do it completely free, is maybe put Linux on there instead. That's not Windows, but it's a very capable operating system. It's absolutely free. Uh, U-B-U-N-T-U dot com is Ubuntu. That's a free one. A lot of people like that one. I personally am a fan of Manjaro Linux, M-A-N-J-A-R-O dot org. 
If you're a little bit geeky, put that on there instead. Wipe out Windows. Start fresh. It's more secure. It has every, you know, everything's free, including there's a free office suite and all that stuff. I think that's a better way to go. And if you love Windows, just, you know, get a copy of Windows. That's a good point. He probably, since he's got a registered copy of Windows, just install up on top of it. Although, I don't know if that would fix the problem with the admin password. Hello, Rod. I did get your book. Yay. And oh, I got the magazines. Yay. Thank you. Oh, good. Excellent. That is a. I meant yeah, to bring I it in today because I wanted to show everybody. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I thought, in honor of that, maybe we'd talk about the Saturn V today. If that's yes, okay with you. Yes. And by the yes. way, I, I loved your your answer in the last call when he said I bought a computer from a guy. It's huh, kind of like that's a bad you know, start. When your young daughter comes home and says, "I met <laughs> oh, this really cool oh, guy at a biker bar, yeah, Dad," and you go, "No, no, no, no." no. <laughs> Do you have adult kids? <laughs> Yes, I have a son who's 25, and he's uh, he's been kind of amazingly low maintenance, I have to say. Yeah, I love my 25-year-old boy. My daughter, who's 28, a little higher maintenance, <laughs> but I still love her. I still love her. They're more work, but they're, but, but daughters are worth it. Yeah, cool oh, I love them way. both. I really do, yeah. yeah. But I, I kept my kid off. Uh, my graduate work was in... Uh, was in media and it, my my thesis was on computer games and oh wow. and so forth I back in the that. 90s that's you know, cool when we worried about that stuff yeah. so i kept my kid off of computer games till he was about i don't know 12 or 13 and you know it's tough he hates you now water cooler talk for kids <laughs> no he, hates he actually when he was 16 17 he started thanking me he said dad i am so grateful you did that and i said why and he said because my friends have all turned into zombies yeah yeah, there is that. They, they just sit and stare at this. They're thing not all violent, but they so are zombies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he never missed it. Good. We did lots of other fun stuff. That's instead. good. Yeah, well, you're a good dad. That's great. Well, sometimes <laughs> that's a good nobody, thing. Nobody hits the mark all the time. Huh? Well, I know. Believe me, that's tough. Anyway, yeah, yeah you know, I have uh, a picture of the Apollo 11 computer on my wall at home. I'll show you sometime. It's beautiful. Uh, I interviewed a guy who did a book uh, that took pictures from the Computer History Museum, and they had the the yeah. modules in that Apollo 11 computer, and it's a beautiful image. He actually, after I interviewed him, said, I'll send you an image. What do you want? I said, I want that Apollo 11 picture, that computer, because that's well, incredible. And there was two. You know, there was There, there, there was the one on the landing the, module, but there was, which I think I, I have, the LEM one. And then there, right. yes, and of course on the on the command capsule as well, right? But the lemon well, one is the one that one did on error, error 1201. Right? 1201 and 1202, yeah, yeah. Which, which just about tanked that landing. But thanks to Margaret Hamilton, yep. they made it. Amazing story. Amazing. Love the pictures in your book. It's just a beautiful book. I oh, just thank love you. it. It's that on our so coffee table. To do and, I bet. And God bless Buzz for the forward. Oh, Great. man. Oh, man. Anyway, we'll talk in a few. Leo Laporte, <laughs> the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Paul is on the line from Bethesda, Maryland. Hello, Paul. Hello, Leo. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I am doing great. Hey, I'm not going to hold you up too long. I have a very quick question. Sure. Um, I need to use Zoom. But I don't trust Zoom, and I don't think I ever will with their, you know, their security updates. So my question is, I have a Mac, and as can I get to Zoom as a guest user without my data on my other accounts being compromised? Yeah, Zoom now has a web interface that I think would be secure for you to use. I, you know, when Zoom, so last year, Zoom got in a lot of trouble because the way the Zoom installer worked, it installed a web server on your Mac, which they did for, you know, somewhat rational reasons. They wanted it so that if you saw a Zoom link, you could click it. It would, the web, if you didn't have Zoom installed, the web server would go, okay, would get Zoom, install it, and you'd get online. So it was a convenience thing. But the problem is, even if you uninstalled Zoom, the Zoom web server would continue to run on your Mac. And it's at one point, Apple got so irate because Zoom didn't fix it that they just blocked it. And that's, I'm sure, where your, you know, kind of visceral memory of Zoom being unsafe comes from. They did not 
I think, do the right thing last year. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's now two years ago in, in uh, 2019. Um, of course, when every during when the pandemic started, everybody started using Zoom. A lot of people said, "Oh no, this thing has all sorts of problems." Zoom took it very seriously, and they hired uh, consultants, some of the best people in the industry, some of my actual heroes in security, to fix it. And I do believe they've done a lot of things to make Zoom secure. I don't. There are still problems, you know. Um, there was a renegade, I guess I'll put that in quotes. They claim it was a renegade Chinese employee uh, just a few months ago that uh, killed Zoom accounts if you mentioned Tiananmen Square, which, of course, the Chinese okay. government's very sensitive to. And it is the case that most of the Zoom coding is still done in China. Yes. So there's, there's reasons to still be a little suspicious. On the other hand, it's pretty hard not to use Zoom if all your clients and colleagues... Start Zoom calls, right? That's correct. Like, you know, I thought most people would have FaceTime, but it's, it's Zoom it is, it seems. No, unfortunately. I would far prefer to use something from Apple. I trust them a lot more than I do Zoom. But I, I will I, reassure you that, you know, people like our security uh, guy, we do a Security Now podcast with Steve Gibson. He's taking a look at the white paper, at the people Zoom hired, like Katie Masuris. And, and uh, they even bought a company called Keybase at Keybase.io, which I was a big fan of, real crypto experts. And they've implemented end-to-end -end encryption and, and done things pretty much what you should do to make it so more secure. So I feel like it's more secure than it used to be. I understand your hesitance. Uh, there is, I believe, a web version. I think that would solve at least that issue of installing Zoom. Right. Um but, you know, the problem is there's no third-party tool you can use to join a Zoom call. You have well, to use that's Zoom. The, that's the thing. What I had planned to do was use it through Safari and have my account set up through a Gmail account. Uh, I think that's account. good. I think that's okay. a, all prudent. And okay, and then come as a guest user in my Mac yeah. with that. And I th hopefully absolutely you get into my other account. You are doing everything you can to isolate Zoom. Safari's going to sandbox it. If you're in a guest account, as you know, the Macintosh, when you log out of that guest account, wipes everything. You'd right. be, it'd be very hard for Zoom to do anything nefarious under those uh, circumstances. So I think you're okay. Excellent. You've made me feel much more comfortable. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. You're welcome. I'm glad you called. I don't, I, and I completely sympathize. Um, I think it's not, un, you know, I don't want to be xenophobic. Uh, I was a Chinese major in college. I love the Chinese people. I love the country. But they don't have the nicest government in the world. And any company that operates in China, and this includes, by the way, Apple, uh, has to follow Chinese law, just as we would expect any company operating in the U.S. to follow U.S. law. And uh, now Zoom is ostensibly an American company, but all of the coding is done in China by three independent companies. That's some cause for concern. I think it's reasonable to assume that if the company is in China, as it run as a Chinese company, that the authorities in China have access to anything that company does, including up to and including putting a back door in the software. Now, I think Zoom understands that their business, especially outside of China, relies on trust. I think that's why they hired all these people, why they bought this company, Keybase, why they did everything they could to reassure people, including firing that Chinese employee who discontinued the accounts that mentioned Tiananmen Square. But there is this still, I, uh, this background noise feeling that, eh, eh, is it really trustworthy? So what you're doing is actually kind of smart. It's not Apple gives you this kind of way of of running uh, in a more secure fashion. And I think that's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's the, the, look at computing requires a level of trust. So does driving down the highway We're in a modern age. We are completely interdependent and we don't know what any of our software is really doing. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're going to talk space with Rod in just a sec. Yeah, I use Jitsi, which is open source software. 
totally secure, and I host it on a server down the hall, but I can't get anybody to use it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I set it up. It has our Twit logo on it. We own it. It's completely secure. It's encrypted. It's all of that. But I can't get anybody to use it. We use Zoom and Google Meet. And, uh, you know, the thing I like about Jitsi, it's just a, it's a web browser. You go to twit.team. That's our server. And, uh, and you can make, an, you know, you can create a, a conference. But that's the problem with all of this stuff. It's, it's the problem with WhatsApp. It's time for our rocket man himself, Rod Pyle. He's the author of Space 2.0. Just sent me his book that came out last year on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. What a Is that in bookstores still, Rod? Because that is a beautiful book. Yeah. yeah wow. It's, uh, in its sixth printing, I think. Oh, as so it should be. a good year. You got Buzz Aldrin yeah. doing the right in the forward, but you've got all these beautiful images, the history of Apollo 11. That's a book everybody should own. That is an amazing, amazing book. It was so much fun to do, and I, I was uh, fortunate. I got uh, interviews with a couple of the astronauts' kids. So oh, the that's Armstrong neat. boys, and then you know, Andy Aldrin. And Andy, Andy told this great story about, you know, I said, were you scared when your dad was on the moon? And he said, you know... I trusted NASA, and I knew they had tested the technology, yeah. and I was confident. And he was about our age at that time. Yeah, yeah. He said the only thing I was, you know what I'm going to say, the only thing I was scared of was that that cable between the lunar module <laughs> and the antenna dish, that my dad was going to trip over that and embarrass me in front of my friends <laughs> at school. <laughs> I thought, teenage boys are all the yeah. same, you know? You know, in yeah. hindsight, they, that mission hung by a thread a couple of times. Oh, yeah. uh, it was a little more dangerous than we realized, but still, I think one of mankind's proudest achievements. It's just an amazing story. I still get chills. I got so upset when uh, when they made that uh, horrible movie about Neil Armstrong, first, uh, first man, first right? man, Damien Chazelle's made yeah. up, fictionalized story. It made me so angry. Yeah. Do, when you talked about Neil's kids did they were they upset that neil was an absent father or something um not so much um but but in general and I, and I was on a panel about two years ago with uh jim hansen who wrote the book as well and i said so let's talk about that charm bracelet on the moon thing yeah okay yeah you know what do you think and he said well he said you know i, I was an advisor on the movie and I felt pretty lukewarm about that, but that was the director's need. You know, yeah. I mean, we can't say for sure it didn't happen, but I have didn't to tell Neil, you, I mean, Neil listened, disappeared for a few minutes at one point, right? He did. Yeah. Well, and and they the, the geologists loved him for that because Mission Control had said, you guys never walk out of camera range right. on this first mission, period. Right. right. But Neil got excited. He wanted a sample. And he told one of the geologists, I want to go get this sample. Yeah. And they said, uh, if you think it's okay, go for it. So he did. And the other thing is, I think the portrayal of Buzz was kind of unfair. You know, they really made him seem kind of reptilian. And yeah. he was he was an odd fit in that group because he was the only one with a PhD and he was all business. But he wasn't that, you know? Yeah. I Don't watch that movie. There, shortly thereafter, a wonderful documentary about Apollo 11 came out, which was full of some amazing footage, high-def footage from NASA and stuff. And I thought mm. that was so much better. I don't know. Maybe I just don't want my heroes tarnished but i think what what neil and buzz and mike collins did is so amazing and so courageous and such a a, a success story that i'd hate to see any movie tear them down in any way even the slightest little bit so i you well, know and and the way they portrayed armstrong on the moon i mean you remember the downlink as it was being you know hosted to us by walter cronkite those guys were having a blast they up loved there it. of course Neil armstrong they did. wasn't stumbling around depressed about his family life thinking no, oh i guess i'll pick I up know. a rock and I even mean, if their, he was their voices were, that's that's the irrelevant I don't care if Christopher yeah. Columbus was cranky when he sailed the ocean blue. It, it's irrelevant. <laughs> right. That wasn't what happened. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was a little misleading. I, I have to agree. And and I loved the, I think the doc you're talking about is the CNN one they played in IMAX. And then I also worked on um, the one that Nat Geo did that came out a Some little really bit good after. Stuff. It was only yeah. on TV. Yeah. But the thing about the CNN one was. 
they found this cache of 35 millimeter frames. That was Everything amazing. NASA shot was in 16, yeah. right? Yeah. And 16 millimeter frame is about the size of your thumbnail. Yeah. It's yeah. tiny. But uh, they found this cache of 35 millimeter through a guy who had helped. Uh, transfer a bunch of it. And I was stunned because I'd gone in and talked to the chief of communications at headquarters years before that in the late 80s saying, is there any 35 millimeter footage? And he said, you know, see that corner of my office? I said, yeah. He said, I had a stack of footage over there in cans that was not developed. I couldn't get NASA to pay to develop it. So we tossed it. And so I thought that was it. And then they found all this stuff. And if you saw Including that in 70 theater, millimeter stuff. Including 70. Yeah, that's right. It's right. 70. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the shots of the crawler on oh. the Saturn V up there, I mean, oh. just... Well, the Saturn V's back in the yeah. news, isn't it? That's the rocket that launched them to the moon. Yeah. The most powerful rocket we've ever made. Right. Um, and in fact, is that the fastest humans have ever... There was a manhole cover that entered space that went... <laughs> do you remember that story? No, I don't. That's a cool story. During nuclear testing in the 40s... A, uh, a, it was probably on the Bikini Atoll. I'm not sure where it was. A manhole cover got launched into space at 125,000 miles an hour. <laughs> and they believe it crossed the, the plane of Pluto in 1961. And it's still going. And for a long time, that was the fastest man-made object ever launched into space. But I think maybe the, wow. the Saturn V got even a little bit faster. I'm not sure. I don't think it got quite that fast. That's I mean, pretty the, the fast. The fastest trip they did was, <laughs> I think, coming back from the moon from Apollo 8, if I remember correctly. And they re-entered at 25,000 miles an Yikes. hour, so not quite that fast. I think the fastest now, faster than that manhole cover you're talking about, was uh, <laughs> New Horizons. Because that thing got a big push out to Pluto because they didn't want to loiter around so far. for a decade yeah. to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it was. Uh, yeah. So there's some really dispute something. over this manhole cover. Apparently, there are some that say it didn't. Yeah, happen. I would think. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's like but nuclear bombs. You know, <laughs> you, as you probably know, there was a spacecraft called Orion that was designed, never built, but designed in the 50s and 60s. And they worked on it for over a decade. Worked on the the design studies that was going to use uh, atom bombs for propulsion. Yikes! And this thing. They had a number of designs ranging from, I think, 10,000 tons up to almost a million tons. <laughs> so, you know, you'd have this thing that's 100 feet across and you're all sitting in your Barco loungers like they did in those 1950 movies, chewing gum and waiting for the Big Bang. And it would eject a small nuclear um, warhead every every <laughs> few seconds. And they'd go off and it had a they would go out the back and it had a plate called a pusher plate. When these bombs exploded, the force would, would push the thing forward. Freeman Dyson was one of the, the principal designers on this thing. And I think the, the what was the saying? It was uh, Mars by, by 1965 and Saturn by 1970 or something. Because it could attain those kind of velocities because yeah. you've got this yeah. continuous acceleration. Wow. But they, they realized, you know, it wasn't so cool launching things with nuclear bombs off of Earth and... You know, Dyson calculated it would only kill a few people per year statistically, <laughs> and when you look at how many That's people, not bad. well, but think about, but think about the Corvair, right? Which you know, killed far more. That's in right. The '60s, That's right? right. Yeah. You know, you were losing thirty thousand people a yeah. year then, but yeah, they decided that. I remember the controversy when we thing. launched, and I don't remember what it, what, what vehicle it was, uh, a nuclear fusion reactor. Or fission reactor in fission, the, yeah, fission. in uh, one of the uh, uh, long long voyage satellites. And there was some concern if that should well, blow up, that would be a problem. They, they launched a reactor called SNAP-10 in, I think, the late 60s, early 70s. And that was a very small fission reactor that worked for a while. There was some concern about that, but it was it was kept very quiet. Was the that Cassini? The big flap was about Cassini, Cassini. and, um, and uh, Galileo. Yeah. Both had, yeah. They had isotope heat heat units. They had a little plutonium plug that just gave off heat, and then thermocouples converted that to power, I won't as did the Voyagers. I won't spoil The Martian for you, but it is a big part <laughs> of that fabulous novel and movie um, yeah. where he just scienced the heck out of it. Mr. Rod Pyle, always a pleasure. I, we did, I don't know what you wanted to talk about. I completely hijacked your segment. <laughs> I apologize. Next week. Come back Saturn next week. Computer.
Saturn V yeah. computer, because we were talking about, I have the a picture of the Apollo 11 LEM computer, but the, the rocket itself had a computer. We'll talk about that next right. week. Right. And it saved the day. Yes. Ad Astra Magazine. Subscribe. Rod's the editor-in-chief. If you love space, you'll love that. Space.nss.org. And we will talk again next week, Mr. Pyle. Thank you, sir. Burning up his fuse out there alone. <laughs> On the high seas. <laughs> Yeah, what do you know what those lyrics yeah, are? Yeah, burning up his fuse them. out there alone. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> I never understood that, it. That sounds a little <laughs> creepy. Never, not once. In fact, the only reason I know is because somebody told me recently Rocket Man burning out his fuse up here alone. Or, I saw Elton John a couple of years ago. He sang the song. I'm looking at him closely, knowing it's coming. I still don't understand what he's yeah. saying. Kind of mm. like you Nagata know, DeVita, honey, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> or Louis. Did we Louis. ever figure out what that was? No one knows. Was it in the Garden of Eden? In the Garden of Eden, baby. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes more makes sense, sense than anything yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'm we're, so the, we're the square. the same generation. It's hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> were you square well, though as a we teenager? Were, I was, and when you and I were in school, I don't know what it was like where you were. I grew up in Pasadena, California. Santa Cruz, and class of 73, Santa Cruz High. Oh, well, then you had this times 10. I'd have friends that would, you'd be at a party, and they'd walk up and say, look what I got. And they'd have a handful of pills, and you'd say, what are they? And they'd go, I don't know. <laughs> they take them. Just take them. Get you out of your mind? That could be decon <laughs> for all you know. That's what it is. So, yeah, I, I didn't even drink till I was 21. Yeah. I was a ter ter total square. I probably should have done that. <clears throat> I didn't take any decon, oh, yes? to my knowledge. <laughs> uh, well, I went, see, I went in 7th, uh, 8th, and ninth grade, I went to a uh, Quaker boys' school in Rhode Island where you had to wear a necktie. Oh. And then in 10th wow. grade, it was Santa Cruz High with girls. Woo! Woo! That was a contrast. So oh. you can't blame me for kicking up my heels just a little bit. Okay, so is is the Giant Dipper not the best roller coaster? Oh, I hate it. So I've only been on it once in really? high school. I got off it. I fell to my knees on the beach in tears. My girlfriend said, "What's wrong?" I said, "I almost died." <laughs> oh, I do not like roller I used coasters. To ride that thing. But if you like oh. roller coasters, yeah, because it's rickety, it's wooden, and at one point you go through a tunnel where the beams are this far above your head, going right. <laughs> In fact, a sailor stood up and killed himself on that thing. So, yeah, and it's dark, so you keep you thinking, know. you know, if one of those things fell down. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, Oh man! I, but it's a, such a neat park. Yeah, that, it is. that, that whole yeah. That I whole spent a lot of time at the board, and I love Santa Cruz and under the board. Incredible. Work. Yeah, those were the oh. days. <laughs> anyway, nice to talk. Really? Have a have a, I got to go, but have a wonderful day. Okay. Stay safe. Stay Thank on you, your sir. boat. Take care. And uh, we'll talk next Doing week. And you, this time we'll do the Saturn yeah. V computer. Okay. Take All care. Right. Bye. Thank you for letting me be your geek again. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks to Lady Laura, our uh, professional musical director who discovered the weirdest song ever, Honey Cones, Want Ads. She says it's her favorite song. It's her theme. Also, thanks to Kim Schaffer, our phone angel, for getting you on the air. Thanks most of all to those of you who call. Just those you also serve who also merely sit and listen. You're, you're frankly the reason this show exists, and I am very grateful to you. And I hope you'll come back next week. We'll do this all again. But we've got time for a few more calls. Let's see. Dave is on the line from Ridgecrest, California. Hello, Dave. Well, hello, Leo. <clears throat> That was an interesting session there, whoever you were talking to. That, our space guy, Rod about. Rod Pyle. We were talking about space, yeah. Uh, and then about our years in high school and the boardwalk in Santa Cruz. I don't know how we got on that one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I uh, on my uh, favorites, uh, I have several weather sites. Yeah. And uh, a while back, several, several months ago, somehow, somewhere, uh, Yahoo... Uh, weather for my area showed up, and I started using it. And uh, if you don't 
have it in front of you, 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 you may not be able to figure out what the heck I'm talking about. But um, on the left, they have a list of, I don't know, links right there. There are sites, different cities around the world. And then right above that list, there's another uh, supposed to be my locations, which I put in. And I had them, had them in there. And then the other days, they just suddenly disappeared. And I can't get them back. And uh, it says, a uh, little thing down under underneath, it says, uh, to save that location, you click the star, which is by the box that says change locations. Yeah. Well, I thought before that when I clicked that, it automatically went into my locations. But it's not doing it now, and I'm not sure why. I can't figure out. Uh, their, their help is not very useful. Yeah. So I'm clicking the star right now. It's not doing anything for me. Um, I wonder. So the way it saves those uh, is a thing that you probably heard of called cookies. You hear people talk yeah. about cookies in your browser. And I think yeah. there's a general feeling that cookies are bad. Cookies are evil. Because sometimes cookies can be used by advertisers to keep track of where you're going, uh -huh. things like that. Uh -huh. But that's exactly what most sites use cookies for is to save information like what your locations are. It's not going to save that on Yahoo's server. They don't want to do that. So they just use the browser and the browser's capability to save cookies to, to save that to your hard drive. It's called, uh, the technical term, persistent client-side state information. State is, you know, like what page you're on, what, what cities you like, things like that. So it wants a way to save that, and cookies the way to save that. If you, in your browser, and many browsers now do this, some of them even automatically, uh, delete cookies or block cookies, it'll stop working. Um, so can you add new locations with the star button or not? No. You can't? It just doesn't respond? No. Yeah. I suspect that that's because modern browsers, which, which browser are you using? Do you know? Firefox. Firefox does this. Um, I th and I, in fact, I'm on Firefox right now, and it won't let me. The, I click the star, and nothing happens. And I suspect this is because Firefox has cookie blocking technology built in. So the, well. <laughs> the, the, the way, that's okay. But the, And I, this is part of my problem. People kind of overstate the danger of cookies. Yeah. And by doing so, they also are kind of eliminating some useful features. So uh, I would go into the Firefox settings and look at the privacy settings. Um, uh -huh. Many people will choose, for instance, strict, and that might block that Yahoo cookie capability. So what you might want to do is change the privacy settings. You could change it globally by choosing a different privacy setting or turning off tracker protection, but there might also be a way, there ought to be a way to say, for Yahoo, save the cookies. Don't block the cookies. I like the cookies on Yahoo. You may want to continue to block them in other places, but Go look at cookies and site permissions, which is okay. another another section there. And I think in cookies and site permissions, you can say allow all cookies from Yahoo. Yeah, there's an get, well, that's, go to Yahoo. Kind of interesting because I have an online version of my our local newspaper, which I am trying to block the cookies yes. because they get in the way of my yes. reading the paper. So there you go. So yeah. what you'd like is permissions by site that's under in firefox under cookies and site permissions and you just go into the cookies and site data and you can say allow yahoo.com you'll probably want to enter asterisk.yahoo.com because what that says is allow yahoo any part of yahoo including weather to set cookies or you could use the actual url for yahoo weather and say only this page can set cookies once you turn that on once you turn that on, uh, they should save cookies. Now, I'm concerned that you're blocking cookies to block ads. They're not related. That's a different feature. <laughs> so the thing in your local newspaper that you don't like is probably all the ads. 
Uh, blocking cookies does not help with that. Cookies got lumped in. In fact, nowadays, thanks to the European regulation, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, in, in Europe, almost all sites, when you first go to them, say, we use cookies, okay? Which has some notably annoying side effects. One, it kind of immunizes you to the whole idea, right? You just go, yeah, 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 okay. Two, it's an annoyance. you got to click every site you visit. That's just a useless annoyance. Three, it assumes that all cookies are bad. They're not. You, you just came up with a really good reason to allow cookies. And most of the time, that's what cookies are used for. They're not evil. They're just saving state information, just like you would save the state of a game with a saved game. So... You can turn, I would say, be less, maybe just unblock Yahoo Weather. Uh, and then if you want an ad blocker to make your local newspaper easier to read, remember you're eliminating their monetization strategy. So you may also be eliminating the newspaper in the long run. But there are better ad blockers. My favorite on, on Firefox is called uBlock Origin. And it's a Firefox extension you can download for free from the Firefox site, uBlock Origin. And that allows you to turn off all advertising. What I would suggest is you allow it on sites where it's just not as annoying, sites that you want to support, because they do need that, just as we need advertising to support us, those sites rely on that advertising. It's a free site. So uBlock Origin has a big on-off switch uh, under the extension that you can click, and I unblock uh, ad blocking on sites where I want to support them. And, it's, and if it's not too intrusive. Unfortunately, yeah, it's the case that some sites, especially like small local newspapers, they've just made them unreadable. And it's also a security issue because a lot of these uh, sites are using animation and scripting and other technologies that potentially are dangerous. So I understand why people do it. Um, I have mixed feelings because <laughs> everything I do is ad-supported. I don't charge for anything. Uh, and so... If people were to block all advertising, they'd put me and your local newspaper out of business. Thanks for the call. And it's that's a perfect example, isn't it, of, uh, of sometimes you can be overprotective. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Please have a safe, healthy Geek Week. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.